Oh, yeah. Just generally. Okay, let's get rolling, you guys. Um, here we go. Hi! How are you guys? Good? Yes? Okay, awesome. Well, um, tonight we are checking in on one project. Uh, you finished one project. We're all done with accommodation. Um, thank you all. I saw those rolling in the submissions. Um, we're going to check in on the digital engagement project, and then we're starting the infographic. Um, the infographic will look at the assignment sheet, and then we have two. Uh, Carl's got some theory background um, on why we're doing this project, and then I'll be talking very specifically about visuals, the readings that we asked you to do, and some of the readings that we asked you to do, and infographics specifically. Like what are they? What do they look like? What might you think about? And yeah, so we'll do that part after the break. And before the break, we'll look at the assignment sheet and get Carl's kind of big picture theory um, on <laughs> on the, why visuals can be so valuable um, to help specifically with challenges associated with sustainability. So first things first, we want to check in on the digital engagement project. You all got your team assignments, correct? Yes? Like anything, eye contact, a nod, come on, work with me guys. Okay, thank you. I am just as tired, fried, whatever you are, I can promise you. Um, we put the announcement, of course, on Canvas so you have quick reference. Um, are there any questions right now? We wanted to just kind of open the floor and kind of make sure everyone's, yeah, Sam. Uh, I saw my name before, but I don't see it now. Uh, is it not at the top? Aren't you one of the top ones? Oh, you know what? This is the um, the online class. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nobody else saw their name. Yeah, no, just... you're not alone. You're not alone. Okay, here we go. Should I say that you can't come in? Yeah. Oh no, Sam, we dropped you from the class. I forgot to mention. You're you're a group of one. Everybody complained about you, so you, know. <laughs> you made it worse. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here are the teams. Thank you, Sam. All right, so you all have your teams. Any questions about the assignment, the proposal that's due after spring break? Anything? No, nothing. Josh Are you feeling team. good? Do any teams already know exactly what they're going to do? Yeah. The proposal is after or which one? Um, no. What? The proposal. It's due the week after spring break, so three weeks from today. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's no, if, like Carl just said, if you want to get it done early, go for it. Um, yeah. a, couple, um, a, a couple of people who will remain nameless for their own protection uh, just suggested to Cato and I that we have assignment due right There's after spring both break. Both the infographic and the proposal are due the week after spring break, and so we're going to look at the possibility of bumping back the infographic due date. How many of you are, are not even... How many of you are traveling over spring break? Like, and not even going to be able to do stuff, like half the class? No, traveling. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so, um, let, we're going to look at it. Um, and make sure that there wasn't, like, obviously, we had some reason to put both due dates on the same week. Like, I know we talked about it. It wasn't we'll worry about heavily, this. I don't know. We'll look at it after We'll worry about this after class. Um, but if that's something that's freaking you out right now, we're thinking about it. Uh, the proposal, do you know what you're doing for the proposal? Do you know what that is? Are you feeling, have you looked at the assignment sheets? Could we talk about the project proposal? The project proposal for the infographic. Yes, let's go over that. Um, uh, is it this? Yes, okay, here we go. Why do I have two links? I don't know. Okay, so here's the assignment sheet. Um, the digital engagement and outreach assignment sheet. Um, this first chunk of it uh, just describes the assignment, which I think at this point probably you have a pretty good sense of between Maya's visit to the class and our discussions. Um, you as a team are going to be creating <coughs> something, evaluating something, making something, doing something, and then you're going to tell us about what you did at the end of the semester. You have three specific deliverables. The first one is due during week 10, and that's the proposal that I was just talking about. The reason that we're asking you to write a proposal is it's a group project and you have a lot of time to work on it, including our last three class meetings, all we're going to do is work in class. We know that you're busy professionals. We know that you have jobs and lives and families, and it can be hard for teams to work outside of class. Wow. So we are dedicating what? You're flattering. What? Oh, okay. <laughs> Ex yeah. 
Except for some people. <laughs> so we... Not uh, above flattery. No, no. Um, so we wanted to make sure that you had time at the end of the semester to work with your groups in, in a format. We'll do a little bit of structure to those. So we'll, we'll ask you to sort of informally report on your progress as a team to us, for example, and to the whole class. Uh, the reason for the proposal is to make sure that your team it has a prompt and a milestone to be planning before we get to that point and to know what you're going to be doing. Because if you decide to, for example, make videos as your project, that's not something you can do in the last, I guess you could do it in the last week before it needs to be turned in, but that probably would not create a product that the whole team is happy with. The description of your book has to be invested. Yeah, so um, we're, let's look at the exact description of the proposal. Um, Team writing. So the proposal report um, is a four to five page analysis and proposal report in which you first analyze one or more portions of the FMAP's digital presence and engagement efforts, and two, propose what your team will do during the course of the project to support the FMAP. The analysis part is just the description of the problem. We looked at their Facebook page, we um, thought about it, we realized here's a problem, and then the proposal is, here's what we're going to do to fix it, yeah. or to support the FMAP in fixing it. If you're more familiar, if you're more comfortable with what people would call needs assessment, yeah. you could also, instead of identifying a problem, you could say, okay, we looked, at their, we looked at their project, we looked at their online presence, and it looks like to do what they want to do, they need the following kinds of things. And your proposal, you know, obviously yeah. enough, you can't propose to do something they don't need. First yeah. step is, do they have a problem better? Is there need? Is there something lacking, missing, not yeah. being done right? And that's preliminary to saying, here's what we plan to do. The other value in the proposals, in addition to prompting a team to uh, get on the same page ahead of time, is to give us the opportunity to let you know what we think the pitfalls might be of your project if you're biting off more than you can chew. Uh, I fully anticipate that half the teams will propose something that we go, this is way too much. Like, you don't. We're already impressed if you just do half of this. Um, and so we will be turning those around as quickly as possible to you. Speaking of the accommodation, just a quick aside, um, Stephanie and Carl have graded all of the accommodation projects they're supposed to grade. The reason you don't have those grades back yet is my fault for the epidictic. So if you're upset about that, blame me. Um, in the proposal, make sure that you include, I just, I wanted to, somebody's got to get thrown under the bus. Okay. We you didn't have to do that, you know. <laughs> Fair enough. We were trying to get them back to you already, and unfortunately, I didn't get to. She's week. writing a dissertation. Yeah. You got to give her a break. Fair enough. You're happy blaming her. The oh, okay. You're happy blaming me. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. cool. So, so it's actually technically my fault, but if you would like to blame him, since I'm her I'm dissertation director, I'm, yeah. I'm to blame anyway. That's true. Okay, so we have in the proposal. Um, I've got this list of four things that absolutely needs to be in there. So, detailed description of what it is that you're planning on focusing on. Right? Are you making something that you're envisioning as being only useful for their website? Are you planning on doing a project that is useful across all their digital media platforms? Are you planning on doing something Sorry. Oh, My that is uh, useful in a space that we don't know about yet? Um, then an overview of what you're going to do for the project. So just you know a paragraph or two saying, we want to do X. We want to make videos. We want to design flyers. We want to make a K-12 lesson plan. And then brief justification of the value. And then we're also asking you to include a task schedule that lists individual tasks, deadlines, and who's responsible for completing them. Um, you, if you've worked on major group projects before, you may or may not have done these kinds of things. Um, sometimes you'll see Gantt charts used in this way as well. Uh, what we're looking for is an actual detailed breakdown of saying, um, not just this person is responsible for this document, but Again, the making videos, for some reason, that's the only example at the top of my brain right now. Um, uh, go out and collect B-roll footage at the beach. Mary. I don't, you're on the video team, right? Yeah, okay, Mary. Um, that kind of task schedule, again, will let us have a sense of how your team is thinking about how you're going to complete this project and give your team the opportunity to hold each other accountable for the things that you say you're going to do. So if, having said that, hang on, let me, real quick. Having said that, if you pop back up, before we get to the even the proposal part and description, the assignment deliverables 
uh, intro has a little breakdown of what it means to write in teams. When I teach teen writing at the undergraduate level, I have an actual book that I use and I require uh, these very specific deliverables like team contracts and task schedules um, and updates on those things in order to hold teams accountable for working together. We've all worked on teams and hated it. Again, many of you are working professionals, have experiences doing this kind of team project in the workplace, and so we certainly don't want to handhold unnecessarily on that front. But we do expect you to be thoughtful about your team management. Um, we recommend that you, if you want, we recommend that you select a project manager, someone who's sort of in charge of making sure that the task schedule items are getting met, or in charge of, um, for example, emailing people if they haven't done what they say they're going to do, and then that project manager maybe does a little less of the actual writing because they're administering. You don't have to do that if, if you don't want, but you do need to make very careful choices as a team, and you should talk about explicitly this bullet point list. You should talk about why and when you are going to meet in person as opposed to just collaborate over email or Google Docs. Right? You should talk about the technologies to use for communicating. So if you're just making the assumption that everyone knows how to use Google Docs, and one person on your team doesn't, and they're scared to ask or say that they don't know how, then all of a sudden they might not be able to contribute their fair share. Right? Uh, what responsibilities teammates have in terms of replying to emails. You're somebody who checks your email 10 times a day and answers it um, right away. Somebody else only checks their email every other uh, day, if that much. You gotta talk about this stuff as a team. right? We're not gonna tell you to, to do it or, or hold you accountable for doing it or ask you to report in, but you need to read this list, and I recommend that you have at least one face-to-face -face meeting in which you go down this list as a team and talk about each of these bullet point items. I'm sorry I cut you off earlier. I just was going to no, lose that train of thought. That's okay. What okay. were you going to say? Um, she said what, mostly what I was going to say, but one of the reasons we want an articulated work plan for this, this is, this is all kind of like... Uh, if, if you go into an airplane and you peek at the pilot's you know, console there, you see all these things. Every one of those, it's like uh, to put your wheels down, there's a big lever that comes up and it has wheels on top of it, so he knows that it's wheels. Every one of those things is a result of an accident investigation. So all of these things are things that we've seen go wrong yeah. in groups in this class in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And we've started, we've started building more <clears throat> scaffolding around this assignment to say, these kinds of assignments that you really need to sit down as a group and work these things out because every one of these kinds of things are things that have torpedoed a group in the past where they then came to us the day before something was due and said, well, my group, and oops, well, you should have told us that a month ago. Yeah. So that, that's not an accusation. It's just, and if it makes you feel any better, we, Stephanie, Cagle, and I have a team meeting every, every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. And because she's her, she's the team manager. She's the one who tells us who has to do what and gives assignments, and she tells me what to do every week. Yeah. Because she's better at it than I am. Yeah. You need somebody to do that. That's not. That's a non-trivial thing. It's true. She gets to tell her dissertation director <laughs> what to do and when to do it. It's very. Yell at me when I forget something. Yeah. Yeah. You you need somebody who's in charge of that, who's watching the deadlines and distributing the work. Otherwise, somebody does all the work and somebody else is a free rider. You need yeah. that done in public so everybody does their fair share yeah. and they're all accountable. You've got deadlines, you've got you've got markers you hit, what do you call it? Milestones? Yeah, you have milestones that you, you hit so you're on track. Yes, okay. exactly. All of those. So again, we're not asking you to tell like we're not holding you accountable for this stuff. We're not asking you to tell us what choices your team made. We're just saying if your team implodes and comes to us and says this is not working because or um, <coughs> Or you, as an individual, come to us and say, I don't like X, Y, and Z about what's happened, or the product is bad and it's not my fault. The first question we're going to ask is, okay, talk to us about this part, the team management part. Talk to us about the choices that you made, and let's see if we could diagnose where the problem was. Uh, okay. The analysis and proposal report. So the bullet points are basically like, I'm sorry, um, yeah. are they basically like what have happened in the past, so items to keep in mind while you're doing it, or what you're segmentating the, the work? Yeah, yeah, so this is the project management versus the project completion part of things, these right? This is, these bullets, yeah, these are the like administrative parts that aren't about the content of, but about the how. Not yeah. the what, but the how. Yeah, not the what, but the, here, here are things we've seen go wrong. Yeah. Here's some advice on what you need to pay attention to, figure out, get agreed on, so you don't have trouble down the line. Yeah, so. Well, the, the only thing that I was concerned is like it comes 
to things like we, we only have like basically this week and next week, right? To kind of like put it all together. Just the proposal. Just the proposal. Just the proposal. But entails like the proposal entails will. Well, yes and no because to to meet the proposal, you pretty much have to like reverse engineer the project. You know what what you're doing. In a well, way. no, because you you. I mean, yes and no. Obviously, you have to put thought into what it is that you're going to do, and reverse engineer. I think is a useful metaphor for that. But it's also not a contract. It's not like at the end of the semester we're going to be like, oh well, in your proposal, you said you were going to use eight. Uh, you know, five second clips in your video and you use nine. Like there's no, it, it's, it's an opportunity for you to decide what you are going to do as a team and you have to put it in writing. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of like a concern because like, okay, I, I'm here today, mm -hmm. we tired today, then I'm here next week, okay. Friday, I'm, I, 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 I'm flying out. Like, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, I'm coming to class, going home, six in the morning, I'm, I have a flight. Mm -hmm. um, so that leaves me, yeah. <laughs> that leaves me like basically, you know, this week to kind of like sort about all that and then we're going to spring break and then it's due. Well, hang on one second. We can't push, we can't push the due date. No, we can't, we can't push the due date on that one. Let me, let me put it to you this way, give you another way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Anytime. You know, for a proposal like this, what you're doing is working out a conceptual structure. Okay. You're deciding, we've done enough preliminary work looking at their website to see what they need and what's good, and we know why. Okay. Um, you can say, okay, we're going to do, take your pick, we're going to build one of these, its purpose is this, its audience is this. What you're not doing is saying, here's exactly how we're going to do it, here's what it's going to look like, here are all the details. Um, every time I send a proposal in to give a lecture somewhere, you know, they want 250 words, and sometimes I'll be talking for 45 minutes or an hour. Sometimes, if they're lucky, only 20 minutes. But you know, I put something down in 200 or 250 words, and six months later, when I'm about to get on the airplane to go deliver it, I write it up. Or you write a research grant. I've been on research grants where you get a team, they work, you put in a grant, and it's 25 single space pages long, and it's a three-year project. You don't know what's going to happen. There's always slippage between what you say you're going to do and what actually happens. Um, what we're asking you to do realistically is give us your best and realistic sense of here's the need we're filling and how we're going to go about filling it and what we're going to do. And as far as we can tell, we're going to divvy up the work in the following ways. And our plan is to do it you know, by this schedule. But nobody's going to, you know, you know, we're not going to get upset if yeah. your proposal isn't, as Cagle says, a contract that you follow absolutely. You know, as long as we get a quality deliverable at the end, we're really happy. It's not exactly what you described. Now, if you propose to make a video and you make a pot, then that's a problem. But Can you make a what? A pot. Something very different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> If you propose to make an A and you make a Z. Right. No, no, no. I, I, I follow. It just, of all the arbitrary They're the things, ones who are supposed to diss me. Okay. Of all the arbitrary things you could have said, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> mostly, mostly what we're looking for is kind of a large general concept. But these guys up here, he said using his little pointy thing. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, sorry. That was me. That was me. That was me. Hold on. Hold on. I'll fix it. Um, <laughs> There it is. Those guys, those bullet points, are mostly a plan for you guys to make sure that everybody is with the plan. Everybody, ha and you know, it might be you trade duties. So this yeah. is not locked in stone. Yeah. And I, I see your point about time. That just means get it done sooner rather than later. And, and also, get your piece of it done. It's due after spring break, but you have until the Thursday after spring So it's not just it's tomorrow not like, plus five days next week plus. You know, and, it's not and like it's, you come back from spring break and it's due yeah. Monday. We're asking Unless for, you're taking two weeks. We're asking for four to five pages. When I say four to five, I'm imagining double spaced. So that's really only uh, maybe, maybe like 1,300 words okay. across four people. Partly so what the writing hearing, shouldn't take long, I would hope. Yeah, for you. Partly what you're hearing, um, and I'm going to put this in slightly different terms. Uh, when I have a doctoral student write me a proposal for a dissertation, or a master's student write me a proposal for a master's thesis, I know from 25 years of doing this that the more time and energy they put in planning ahead of time, 
the less trouble they're going to have later and a better a project they're going to get. If they just say, I want to do something about this, they're going to have trouble. So all we're really asking is that you do enough planning, largely conceptually, but some project management planning ahead of time so that it's actually much easier and more efficient. The more time you put in at the beginning, the easier your life is going to be down the line. No, no, I get it. I, yeah. and, and I think that I mean, I'm, I'm glad for the explanation. I was just like going into the terms of like how much detail, but now that you said that it's more conceptual. And, yeah, and, I think more conceptual, and, that's a useful way to think about it. should be fine. Okay. Yeah. So, it, oh, it, and if you, tra if you try to titrate everything down to an exact, precise detail, that, that's not going to work anyway. do the same day, as long as the goal we'll, we'll look into that. We'll that'll email be too you. much. That'll we'll be like sensory you. overload. And it's just... Um... And that's fair. Again, I know we had a really good reason for putting them on the same yeah, day. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. Uh, anything else on the proposal? You guys got a good sense of what that's about and what you need to do? Okay. Um, the final report is due the during finals week. Um, we are not having a final exam, uh, obviously. That would, how would we even do a final exam? I don't know. Uh, so we instead, have an amen? Yes, no final exams, right? I'm anti-exam in general. Uh, but during the time period that we would be having a final exam, you will come here um, and you are going to turn in your final report ahead of time digitally so that we can, um, part of why, I like to get hard copies of those kinds of things, but we need it digital so we can share it with Maya um, and the rest of the FMAP team. But then you'll come to class and we'll do 10 to 15 minute presentations from each group talking, telling us, showing up. Maya, unfortunately, is um, already booked for that day. She's giving a talk somewhere. But some of the other local coordinators for the FMAP project are going to come. Um, so you'll have like a real audience of other people besides us, which is kind of exciting. Um, yes, all right, the final report, what we're asking for is something longer, seven to 10 pages. That one, um, we had a hard time talking about length because it might include images, it might include you know, illustrations and who knows. My guess is the actual report for most of you will probably be about seven to ten pages, not including images, and then you'll probably have a bunch of appendices of here's like the things that we made, for example. Um, what we're asking for is for you to describe the work you did and then tell us about the value it contributes to the FMAP digital presence. Um, so you I think that's pretty straightforward, right? You just report on what you did and then tell us why you think it's going to be useful to the FMAP. And that's the place where you get to draw in some of the big concepts that we've been talking about all semester. So you can talk about, tonight Carl's talking about the idea of making the invisible visible. So you can talk about how your thing that you made or are recommending makes the invisible visible. You can talk about how it um, provides a product that might resonate in a particular rhetorical ecology. You might talk, right? So that's the place where you get to demonstrate the um, connections that you're drawing across all of the big concepts that we've covered this semester. We're not asking, seven to 10 pages is pretty short for a final report in a graduate class. <coughs> We're asking in part for a shorter final report because it, you have to do a lot of work to be able to even write that report, right? We're valuing the time that you're putting into the making, the doing, the evaluating. And so we're asking for less writing so that you don't have to you can spend your time making cool stuff, and you don't have to spend a ton of time telling us about the making of the cool stuff. But we do need something written we can evaluate you on. Um, and then the presentation, we're not teaching public speaking in this class. I do teach public speaking, elevator pitches, that sort of thing. But because we're not covering it, we're not going to be grading your presentations on, like, did you say um a lot? Uh, it's mostly, again, just a chance for you as a team to show off your work to each other, to us, to our guests. And if anything, we are covering visual rhetoric so you can make cool slide decks, um, but don't freak out if presentations aren't your thing. We can't grade you on something that we didn't teach you about. Questions about those two deliverables? You'll get a grade, but it's, it's mostly a, if you show up and you know, do it professionally, then you're fine. Anything, any questions? Good, maybe? Feeling all right on that? Okay, okay. This project, I hope, is coming together. I know when we talked about it way back in week one, it was like, what is that even? Um, I hope it's the contours of this project are becoming clearer. Good for you. You were able, you were, last time you were 
compiling a list mm -hmm. and when when we were when we had the presentation about the microplastics, yeah. you kinda like for us to pick up to do the, the breakdown for the quiz for the teams. Yes. Do you still have those that list with kinda like the headings? The really long list? Or the list that was on the quiz? Uh sure. It, it just like the, the list we made in class? Yeah, the, with the different things like Yeah. Because to see what falls within I think There's I think a list. I think it's oh, the brainstorming list we uh, did in class. Like to see what falls within the categories. Oh, we don't care. Because no, here, no. He, wants, he wants to see the list. No, I know, but I'm saying if if you're concerned, you can have the list. But if your concern is that your team does something that falls within that heading that we gave you, so here are the. If you're concerned about making sure that your project fits this heading, the the don't care. Yeah. No, we're not going to get bent out of shape if we say you did a really great project. But I think it sort of falls a little bit in this very closely aligned so category much, and not in this one. We're, we're not going to do that. And again, if you would like the list, I can, I'll can. i just put the list from the, the survey that you took somewhere just so you can see and maybe all, it's for brainstorming purposes. And that's also part of the purpose of the proposal. If you, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that's nice about a proposal, and I tell my doctoral students this, if you give me and my committee a proposal and we read it, and you have to meet with us if you're a doctoral student for an hour and debate it with us. It was like once, we sign, once we sign off on it, then you're good. As long as you do what you said you were going to do, nobody can complain because yeah. we approved it. So if you guys write us a proposal and we read it and give you some feedback, as long as you do that, yeah. you're golden. The proposal is, in some senses, protection for you. Chris? Yeah, well, you actually highlighted mine. Which yeah. It was good because I was honestly kind of confused. Am I making a, do they, this is for Facebook, so. Yeah. Am I Website physically is. making them a Facebook page, or do they have one and I'm supposed to adjust theirs? Because they have a Facebook page. It was assigned reading a couple of weeks ago. Um, the make do means not the multimedia push for the website and Facebook. Doesn't mean like you're making a Facebook page, but making multimedia stuff. That was the idea. But again, your team can propose whatever you want. These are not contracts. This is just these are the things that. The reason that we all we put all four of you in a group was that you suggested in your survey that you were interested in some version of this, and we just wanted you to know what the thing was that had us Part, put you all together. Partly, what's what's confusing you is this one says make, this one says make do. Yeah. Scroll up. Is the one that says analyze? Yeah. There's an evaluate. No, I guess not for this one. Okay. We have one for the. We use we use three verbs to categorize your work. You can evaluate, analyze, and evaluate something. You can make something, you can do something. Yeah. So some people wanted to say, we're going to put together a way of going out and um, soliciting, yeah. organizing volunteers to do the testing. That's a doing. You're out in the world doing. If you say, what we're going to do is put together a whole bunch of really cool infographics that we will give them, you're making something. So we're not asking you to make a website. We're just okay, saying, that's where I was lost, I was make like, multimedia. I no, make multimedia for the, okay. right? So multimedia means literally, it can mean anything. Like maybe you record a cool podcast. Maybe you uh, write up um, an interview with volunteers or the director, right? So that means that you're, again, this is why we need a proposal from you because when you think about, okay, what would be a cool multimedia thing that could get shared on Facebook, you might have a very different idea um, from Lena, right? or from G or Schwang, and so you need to talk to each other and figure out what it is that you want to That's do. That's what I like about that list that we had before the brainstorming. Was yeah. we have like, it was kind of like some details and you can- Some ideas. So I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll post that list as, as an announcement. Like, something would branch yep. out from that, or yep. you know, like, yeah. because yeah. sometimes- Fine, it's, it's, no, that makes sense. We'll, yeah. Nope, perfect. I would say we'll post that, but, but that means that she'll do it. <laughs> I'll post it as an announcement so that you have access to that list. It might be useful, again, for brainstorming purposes and for getting conversations started with your group. He validated my point but, uh, by asking that question. <laughs> yes. But again, we are not concerned with, like, if you do this and then you all talk to each other and somebody is like, you know, I have this really cool idea for a K-12 through thing, like, cool, go for it, whatever. Right? Okay. Good? Anything else? Yes. Yes. I, yeah, the online class is totally separate teams. Oh, because I didn't know Michelle and Joanne. Oh, Michelle's right here, and Joanne's in the back. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. Campus people name is different 
Oh, yes, no, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Michelle is listed as Lauren on campus, right? Yeah. And Joanne, you're listed as Amy. So Amy and Lauren are the people you have to email. And in my department, I'm listed as Dude. Yes, ma'am. Um, this might just be me, but on that list, I yeah. have a group, and then when I click on people and groups, I have a different group. Wait, what people and groups? There shouldn't be any groups. Yeah, people. Yeah. Student groups? That's not a, I don't, that's like a thing that Canvas made. Okay. That's not, so yeah, that's not us. I don't know what that is. Oh, this is, these groups are self-organized by students, so you can make your own group. So it looks like um, y'all made a group. I did. You, okay, so y'all have a group, which means that you can create documents together and stuff. So it just means that you're not organized into a group already. But that's a good idea. How do you do that? I've never done that on the student end. You go, when you click on groups, and then you click on um, so if you new plus group. Plus group up there. Oh, then, plus group set? Yeah. And then you find the people that are in your group, and then you create it. And, it pops up okay. and, you can, you and that gives you a separate Canvas space for just that those identified names, and you can do things, share things. Yeah. Gives That's you an electronic cool. space to work. Yeah, I didn't know everyone's email, so I figured that was a nice way to. Yeah. Some people have images of their cats in their group. Oh, <laughs> yes. I, I think she, you've got a fox, right? Is it? Is she here? Yes, you have a fox, right? For your picture? Is it you? On Canvas? Yeah, I thought so. Um, the other thing you can do, so uh, I didn't, it did not, we did not anticipate people not knowing who each other was. Um, so, you know what, let's just do this real quick. Raise your hand. Um, all right, so we have Team 1 Make 2D Visuals. Raise your hands, y'all. Look around, look around. That's who's Team 1? That's your team, yeah, so. Hal, Sam, Jason, Pedro. Um, team two, make shareable content. What's up? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Who's not here? We got one, two, three. Who are we missing? From Paula. Paula's out. Paula, this yes. Week. So Paula, who sits right up front here, uh, dark hair, glasses. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paula's your fourth. Uh, make videos. Yeah. Who's got make videos? We got one, two, three, and we're missing she. No, she's here. Who are we? Andy. Andy's Andy here. just didn't raise his hand. Thank you, Andy. Andy, your name is Andy, right? Okay. Uh, team four, make do multimedia push. Yes, so we have four, right? Yes, all of us. Um, so, Lena, Trying, G, Chris. Okay. Uh, make do outreach educational audiences, undergrads, or K through 12. Some people said K through 12, but we know that you have an undergraduate audience. So, raise your hands. Raise your hands. Julio, raise your hands. Okay. Yes. So, uh, you guys know each other now? Yeah? And then the last group. So we had Sarah. And then the last group, Make Do Outreach, <laughs> Pick 12. Raise your hands. And then Amy's in the back. Right? No, Amy's not. Or Joanne. I'm sorry. I said, hey, now it's in my head because I just said it. I'm so sorry, Joanne. Okay. So, cool. Good. I'm glad that we discovered this problem and we could address it. The other thing, suggestion I have. So, Chris, that's a great idea with the groups on Canvas. Thank you for doing that. When I do work with my peers, I use my mail.usf account because it's a Google account. And uh, many of you probably know, but if you don't, if you click on the little menu icon and go to Drive, you can create tons and tons of documents and share them. So I have constant, like, I'm working on a chapter, of uh, an article with a friend, and so we just share all the documents. That's one of the things in the proposal. Together. To they don't have to say it explicitly. Yeah. So I recommend Google Docs through the mail.usf account also. All right. Any last questions on that project? There were a lot of questions. I'm glad we decided to talk about those. Anything? All right. Let's talk about the infographic. Before we do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Carl wants 10 seconds. With her. Yes. Oh, what? Yeah. No, no, no. What's then, the week after? One, what are we going to go then over the other one? The one that will be due after Hang that? on one second. We're looking at the, the due dates. We're right answering now. your question. One second. Oh, one second. Okay, good, good. It's workshop. Just push it back. And then, you know, maybe that's pretty simple. It's not a yeah. Okay, so we are going to push back the infographic. Okay. Um, the are... infographic is, is currently listed, he said, as due the week of... 324. Yeah, right here. The following week is the last week where both of us are going to be lecturing and there's a pretty big reading list. Mm -hmm. We'll move the infographic back a week. The reason we didn't 
he said, it looking at list. as we looked at the reading list, I thought, wow, look how much reading they have to do that week. We better not give them anything to do. Um, I, I know when I teach a class and students have a paper due, I never give them a reading assignment because undergraduates can't write a paper and read something for the same class. Yeah. You know, you have a paper due and nothing else happens. You guys are adults, so maybe you can do this. Yeah. Which is to say, we'll push the infographic a week later. Most most are adults. We already covered that. Um, well, I don't. Know. Yeah, you guys are me. I'm I'm, I'm just a gray haired kid. Um, we'll push the infographic down a week. The reason we didn't do that originally is there's a lot of reading to be done that week, and one of the reasons that week is piled full of reading is that's the last reading and the last lecture you get. The next three or four weeks is open for you. Is, so we can move it down. The liability is you have a lot to do that week yeah. as well. But that is that is that okay? Yeah. If you're a group that says no, no, I don't want to do. If you're an individual that says no, no, I don't want to do that and do it that week, you can hand it in early if you want. Mm -hmm. But we'll just push the deadline. Does that help those of you who are traveling yeah. and going to be out of the country? Okay. Okay. Thanks for telling us. It just trust me. Didn't occur. Yeah. When I'm in Mexico, the least thing I'll be thinking is. Yeah, no, I wouldn't something. either. Yeah. You won't no, be no, no, sitting no. on the beach <laughs> drinking a margarita thinking of me. Oh. <laughs> so I'm crushed. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so you, you, I believe your next question, Julio, was when are we going to talk about that assignment? Guess what? That's next on the agenda. Okay. Um, so you were anticipating us. We, the next assignment is the infographic. So if you recall, we talked about the accommodation project is getting at a lot of the big um, concepts of the course with the rationalist paradox, with the idea of influence structuring, structural versus behavioral change, how do we motivate people. Uh, the infographic is getting at a lot of those same concepts as well from a visual point of view, uh, because visuals are a huge part of contemporary communication, as I'll be talking about after the break later. The infographic project, for this project, we're asking for, here we go. All right, we're asking for three deliverables. You are also going to give us next week a very short proposal. One to two page, double spaced. This is an individual project, it's just you. Again, we literally just need to be able to make sure that you're on the right track before you go to all the effort of making an infographic. So we're, we're not even gonna grade those very heavily. We're just gonna glance through them. You did, you did the thing, you get the full points. If we see any red flags, we'll let you know, right? And that's due next week before class. Uh, the uh, behaviors, yes. Okay, so you are going to outline these items. Um, we're asking, sorry, go ahead. If you want to do it as simply as answering those questions in that order, ask yeah. questions, that's fine. Yeah. But these are things you need to have planned before you do it. Yes. This is not a write us a bellatristic essay. No. Give us <laughs> answers to those questions. No. Exactly. So you could, in fact, yeah, as Carl suggested, you can literally put your name at the top of the page and then give us those all as headings. Um, we asked for a business memo format in the past. I'm actually not hung up on that. Um, so, oh, hey, you know what? We we'll changed your mind. This is a Google Doc. Um, because I'm tired of explaining what a business memo format is. Yeah. So. Look at that, that was easy. Ask, you were gonna ask? Yeah. Provide, she it's, the link, so so the, reason, the reason that, I'll, I'll give you my 30 second reason why it's in there, which is that when we're not teaching over here, I teach technical communication and professional writing. That's like my bread and butter. And so I teach um, professional writing for health sciences. I teach professional writing for engineers. I teach, and that, in those classes that matters, right? I need to teach those students how to write business memos. And so, uh, when I wrote these assignment sheets, whatever, three years ago, uh, that was just my instinct was to, oh, everything comes in a business memo format. But you know what? That's not that's not what we're doing here. All right. So uh, I'll have to remember to delete it from the online assignment sheet, too. Don't let me forget. Okay. So the infographic is the second deliverable for this. That's the big one. You're going to actually make an infographic. If you are sitting in your seat going, how the bajarra am I going to do that? Uh, that is what we're going to do all class next week, is we're going to look at two different technologies, free online, that you can use, and we'll have some structured activities that I will walk you through to practice using those, play around with them. Again, I cannot stress this enough. This is something that comes up every year. We are not asking you to become designers. We are not in the business of making graphic designers. 
what we're trying to do is give you experience creating graphic design so that in your future, when you are working with graphic designers, you have that experiential knowledge to be able to say to them, you know what, I really think this layout would work better. Or, you know what, I really think I want to communicate with my audience in this way, can we talk about color palettes? Because if you have the experience of actually trying to make the thing that expresses your vision, you understand A, how hard it is, and how hard graphic designers' jobs are, and B, how important even little subtle choices are. So that's why we're asking you to actually make a thing. If you make a thing and you feel like this does not represent the beautiful vision that I had in my mind because I'm not a graphic designer and I don't want to turn it in and that's terrible, congratulations. That's why you're also writing us a memo so you can tell us that. The, the other thing is, so she's right, we're not trying to teach, if we wanted to make you graphic designers, there'd be a semester on that and there'd be somebody other be than me in front of the room. Class. I taught that class last semester. I teach yes. a visual rhetoric class where all we the, do is make stuff. The other thing, in addition to what Cable has said is, one of the things you teach graduate students, as opposed to undergraduates, is you teach people, here's enough about visual design and making infographics. Should you have to do this at some point, though, Pedro, you're not going to, you now know where to begin and how to teach yourself to do it. You know, we're not making you an expert, but you know how, you now know how to yeah. teach yourself to do this really well with yeah. some more time, should you need to. Don't we can't worry. teach you everything. Don't we have some graphic design people in the class? Am I making that up? What about if you're what? talking graphic design? I mean, like, you're not that good. I mean, what? What about if you're really, you know, like, can you, if you're not going to be like, expertise mm -hmm. level, novice versus, yeah. like, yeah. expert. Yeah, you know. yeah. If you're, yeah, exactly. We, we just want you to, the reading for next week, which is not posted yet because I checked it um, to reread to plan for next week and realized that the student worker who had scanned it for me cut off the third of the bottom of the page. So I have to rescan that for you all. Um, there's a reading from a book called White Space is Not Your Enemy that is a practical guide to design. And the reading is going to give you some language and tools to allow you to not be as sucky of a designer. Is sucky, with, that's what you said, right, Colleen? Um, it gives you literally rules. Like, if you want to do things with color, here are five guidelines. Guidelines is better than rules. Here are five guidelines to achieving whatever with color, to achieving whatever with layout. Here are the 10 things that non-designers do wrong most often to make their designs look unprofessional. So we have a reading to support that, and then we are going to practice using those principles, uh, playing around with some technology next week in class. By analogy, if you take Senshaw's course in systems, in systems analysis, he's not teaching you how to build models. He's not going to, right? He's not teaching you how to program and do all the stuff to be a modeler. But he wants you to know what models do, how they work, what a system model is, conceptually, how to use one and think about it, right? He's not teaching you to be a modeler. You know, you need three or four years to do that. Yeah. This, is, this is analogous to that. Yep. So, like I said, you may find yourself frustrated. That's a great analogy. Thank you. But like I said, you may find yourself frustrated with the, the final product not matching your vision. Uh, and the memo is a great place for you to tell us what your vision is, what you were aiming for. Because like I said, we're giving you some strategies for making good rhetorical choices around design. We'll cover those in the, in the readings and then talking about the readings next week. The memo is the place where you tell us, you know, here's how the infographic makes the invisible visible. Here's how it overcomes some challenges posed by rationalists, ethical paradoxes, right? I'm trying to appeal to people's emotions, not just to their sense of logic, but then also how are your design choices functioning rhetorically? So you really wanted to do a cool thing where you had like a fish that was jumping out of a bottle, but then it was like kind of turning into a bottle, but it's meant to symbolize this thing, and so you were trying to get it to be just the right color, uh, but you couldn't figure out how to adjust it to that color. Tell us that in the memo. Say, you know, I was really aiming for like this perfect shade of aubergine to represent the plight of sweatshop workers, and of pots, let's go with pots. Um, and, uh, and so the memo is the place that we are able to um, grade you based on your vision for the infographic, not necessarily what you were able pro to produce with your design skills. Yes, sir, Josh. Josh. Do you uh, make your infographic relatable to your final project? If you want to. Okay, you can? Yeah, if you want to. So certainly we would hope that for your team project, you would not just you know, recycle, 
rehash, but if you wanted to use, if you wanted to make an infographic that perhaps is um, a starting point for a final project, you know, the people who are doing multimedia stuff, the people who are making 2D visuals, absolutely, you might. So we're walking a fine line equivocating between saying, yeah, hand the same thing in twice, which is not <laughs> what you're asking. No, no. And yes, if you learn, like, enjoy the infographics, does that product, that skill, yeah. that set of um, productive activities translate, can it translate to your final project? Sure. Yes. Yeah, because my share will count then. Yeah. Yes. And, and maybe your team... Yes, and it may be that's what you do. Yeah. Okay. Maybe your team wants to get together beforehand and part of your proposal is we're going to all make infographics that are related to uh, microplastics and then you're going to get feedback from us, which means you basically just got help on your drafts for the final group project and then you could revise and make more whatever. So does that, does that work? Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, there's, you shouldn't waste work, right? We're, professional writers don't waste work. You don't rewrite the same content twice unless your um, publication and uh, copyright requires you to. <laughs> so um, those are due now two weeks after spring break, the memo and the infographic itself. Executive decision. Oh, no, we decided. We conferred. We conferred we really conferred. quickly. So. She, she makes yes. executive decisions, we, too. We conferred. The royal we conferred. <laughs> we have decided. Anything else? Are we good? Yes, this, Andy. This is a, like one graphic that you create. We're going to spend, uh, I have a whole lecture after the break about what an infographic is. So I think that that's what your question is. She means after the break tonight. Uh, yeah, so not have a class break, yeah. tonight. Yeah. Not spring break. Not spring break. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next, week. next week. After tonight's 15 minute potty break, uh, I have a whole lecture. <laughs> I have a whole lecture about what an infographic is. So if you have questions about that part of the project, just hold off until after the not spring break. <laughs> I can see their eyes click on that one. I know, I didn't even it didn't even occur upset. to me about the break. <laughs> Like that you would think I'm in spring. Okay, anyway. Tonight. You, tonight, I will wow you with my knowledge. I don't know, I like of those plans. That would be like going like spring break and going like. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, oh, my oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm losing my mind, you all. I, spring break cannot come fast enough. Okay, any other questions on sort of logistics or the deliverables? <laughs> nope. Okay, so we've got a short-ish. Um, fast. Uh, discussion from Carl on, on this idea of making the invisible visible, and then we'll take 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'll talk to you at length about infographics, and then we'll be done for the night. How much time? <sighs> oh, yeah, no, we're fine. Um, how much time? 30 seconds. Good. Okay. Why don't you, um, yeah, I'll keep an eye on I gotta, I gotta keep an eye on time. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta tell me when to show up. Alright, um, I thought I invented this metaphor, you know, that sustainability is about making the invisible visible. Uh, and then I discovered, reading a bunch of stuff, oh, other people talk about this. I thought I had this brilliant idea and metaphor, but I'm not the only one, apparently, who has come up with this idea. Um, did we give them the Gawande article yeah. to read? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you read this piece. Came out of the New Yorker magazine. It's what I do on Saturday afternoons at home. I drink beer, read the New Yorker and the Atlantic and Harper's and things like that. So this is an article called Slow Ideas. Some innovations spread fast. How do you speed the ones that don't? And I think he's talking about sustainability or similar things to the problems we deal with in sustainability. He's talking about the difference between historically surgical anesthesia and antiseptics. Um, and he says, he's talking about the 19th century, he says, why do some innovations spread so swiftly and others so slowly? Consider the very different trajectories of surgical anesthesia and antiseptics, both of which were discovered in the 19th century. You all know what surgical anesthesia is, right? Okay? Yeah. Uh, Painkiller, go to sleep. Um, go to sleep, go to sleep. Huh? Go to sleep. Yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> me too. Um, I, have, I have this memory of 
being on a gurney going down a hallway looking at the lights flash by. And then the light stopped flashing, and about six hours later, I woke up somewhere else with a tube down my throat. Oh, yeah. Yes. But there's also another little drug. I can't remember its name. It's the one that gives you amnesia. Um, I don't know. There's a, when, when you do general anesthesia, they do terrible yeah. things to you, huh? Yes, this last time they accidentally gave me too much, so I suffered from it for like two weeks of not being able to remember anything it's after terrible. I did it. Yeah, no, there's, there's, a, there's a drug they give you that gives you complete memory loss of everything they did to you during surgery, because it would be really ugly if you remembered that when you woke up. Okay, enough of this. Um, so Gawande, he's talking about these two things, and there were lots of objections. You know, surgeons didn't want to adopt um, either one of these technologies. Um, they, um, they adopted surgical anesthesia relatively quickly. They were really slow at adopting antiseptics. And in the 19th century, death from infection was one of the major causes of death after surgery. People died all the time from, from infections. But why did they adopt one and not the other? So Gawande, this is my analogy, goes on and says, so why did they adopt one and not the other? Uh, what were the key differences? First, one combated a visible and immediate problem, pain. The other combated an invisible problem, germs whose effects wouldn't be manifest until well after the operation. Second, although both made life better for patients, only one made life better for doctors. Anesthesia changed surgery from a brutal, time-pressured assault on a shrieking patient to a quiet, considered procedure. Listerism, that is, named after the doctor, that is um, <coughs> antiseptic, by contrast, required the operator to work in a shower of carbolic acid. They literally had a fine spray of carbolic acid over the operating table, covering everything and, and killing the germs. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Even low dis dilutions burned the surgeon's hands. You can imagine why Lister's crusade might well have been a tough sell. Another paragraph from this guy. This has been the pattern of many important but stalled ideas. I'm going to suggest that a lot of things in sustainability <coughs> follow this pattern. This is why I'm starting with this bizarre analogy. Um, the, they attack problems that are big, but to most people invisible. By making them work, um, and making them work can be tedious, if not outright painful. The global destruction wrought, wrought by a warming climate, health damage to our over-sugared modern diet, the economic and social disaster of our trillions of dollars in student debt, these things worsen imperceptibly every day. Meanwhile, the carbolic acid remedies to them all requiring individual sacrifice of one kind or another, struggle to get anywhere. Um, so the many challenges those of us who work in sustainability face are like this, and they have an upside and a downside. The downside of this is they're caused by human activity. We're the ones doing this. It's not an infection or, or a disease. The upside is if we're doing it, it's arguably within our collective capacity change the scenario and do something different. That's what this course is sort of about. Um, but to change that scenario, you have to get people to understand these issues. You have to get them to be motivated to change. And to do that, especially since we're now talking about visuals, you have to make the, visible, the invisible sustainability visible. Um, like you're introducing antiseptics, we need to make the invisible consequences visible and felt. He said, click. So, has anybody ever heard of Cape Wind? Okay, I, I get the trash Robert Kennedy now. Um, I used to live on this island right here, Nantucket Island. Uh, this is Cape Cod off Massachusetts. That's Martha's Vineyard, and this is Nantucket, the Far Island. Um, I ran a boatyard right there for a while. Um, they are proposing to build one of the largest marine-based um, wind-powered electrical generating sites called Cape Wind, right here in the middle of Nantucket Sound. Um, and the, the problem with this is it's easy to see the turbines. It's hard to see the benefits. So here's, click. That's what it's going to look like from Contwit uh, on the, not Contwit, Cotwit on the mainland. You're going to look out you know, east over the beautiful water from your $10 million beachfront house and you're going to see this. Or click, 
from Edgar Town on, on the vineyard where President Clinton vacations, you know, their place on the vineyard. The, the Kennedys have a house on the Cape. Um, Clinton always vacations on the vineyard. This, this is what you'd see from, oops, no. This, this, what you'd see from the vineyard out here at Edgar Town. And if you live in Nantucket, and you're looking out from where I used to live, you're going to look out to see, um, you're going to see this big thing sticking out of the water. And if you want to look up close and personal, that's what one of these guys looks like, although that's in the field, not out to sea. Um, so it's easy. You can see the blades. They disturb what it looks like in your beachfront house. You know, you're having a romantic evening, and you're looking at an industrial wind farm out in Cape Cod Bay. But what you can't see is the reduction in greenhouse gas that these are creating. What you can't see is the marginal slowing of climate change that this is, this is helping with. And what's ironic is Cape Cod and the people in Cape Cod are fighting this tooth and nail. And Cape Cod, like coastal Florida, is you know, suffering from sea level rise. This is actually a marginal solution to the problem that you know, their houses are going to go underwater in about 50 years due to sea level rise. And they're fighting this because it's ugly. They don't want to look at it. Um, you know, so when people talk about sustainability, um, we need we need to figure out how to bridge the gap for people between cause and consequence. Um, the drawbacks are concrete, they're visible, you can see them, you can feel them. So when we reset the thermostat in my house, uh, or when we limit the amount we drive, uh, when we take shorter showers, those are all things that you can feel and it feels sort of like a sacrifice. But the advantages are, that justify those are hard to see. They're hard to feel. They are not immediate. Uh, they are intangible. They're invisible. Um, if you want to change the way people think, the way they live, the way they th buy things, consume things, from energy to the tomatoes at the grocery store, um, that's a much harder task than getting somebody to just continue doing what they've been doing. The burden of proof is on us here. You know, you are, what is it, innocent until proven guilty. The way we live now is innocent until its consequences are made visible. And a lot of what this course is about, communicating the value of sustainability, is trying to move from, you can look at causes but not see consequences. The, the, the problem, the, you know, the turbines are visible, the benefit is invisible. So, click. There are at least three ways in which sustainability is invisible, time, space, and what I call the mundane. So we can't see the future. Uh, if we did, we'd all know the Powerball lottery. We'd all be bazillionaires. Um, sustainability involves you know, saving resources for future generations. Uh, we have to know, and alas, we have to care, uh, what that future is going to look like. So sustainability science uses models. Click. You know, models to show us what the future looks like. This is an IPCC model of uh, scenarios for global behavior and temperature ranges for the future. And all of these in the last, this one's about four years old. These have all shifted, you know, about a point or two higher now. Um, our worst case scenario is, is, what we're doing now is actually worse than the worst case scenario. But this is how we try to get people to see the future. And that's really hard to read. You don't really see much. This is what science shows us is scenarios and models that show us the future. It's not very visible. It's hard to read. It's hard to understand. It's not compelling. Most people don't trust models. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, people say, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You know, we don't trust models. Models can show you anything. You know, the uncertainty of modeling makes them not very good arguments. They're not very compelling visualizations. But that's often the best science can do. So space. Has anybody here ever heard of the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico? One person. What is it? Anybody? It's, um, I think it's also called like the dead zone. It's called the dead zone. Yeah. A lot of Yeah. This is a picture of the Gulf of Mexico off Louisiana. This is regular water. And this is the hypoxic zone, and it's that clean. Hypoxia is when there is no dissolved oxygen in the water. Everything that lives there is dead. 
If it can't swim or crawl away, it's gone. It's dead. Um, as Pithero is suggesting, he said, click. It's actually, this is a map of the American Midwest. This is the Corn Belt. I used to live right there in the middle of the Des Moines Lobe. And this is a map of nitrogen used on farm fields uh, to boost uh, yields, you know, how many bushels of corn per acre, and how much of it is available for leaching to the groundwater. And the Des Moines Lobe in Iowa is the densest use of nitrogen fertilizer on the planet. And it goes from here into the Raccoon and Des Moines River, into the Mississippi, blah, 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 down in here to the Gulf. According to the EPA, um, the dead zone is, is seasonal. It's worse in the summer. Um, it's not purely cause. It's partly natural phenomena. But the biggest driver of the dead zone is the use of nitrogen fertilizer in the Midwest and in Iowa. But nobody sees it because it's way down here. Um, they don't go out in their boats and try to go fishing. And they don't run into that water. Now, as you may or may not know, there are hypoxic areas like this all around the world at the end of major deltas where there's a lot of farming and we pump nitrogen and phosphorus into the soil and into the water. It's not just like the Louisiana coast. It's a global problem. Um, click. This is an old map, but this is the size of it. It was 20 years ago. It was almost 19,000, no, almost 7,000 square miles. Um, off the coast here, where everything is dead every year. Um, the problem is distance. It's really hard for those farmers in Iowa who are driving their tractors to see that increasing their corn crop and using this nitrogen causes that because it's a couple thousand miles away. Similarly, you know, if I'm, you know, if we're doing things here that, you know, uh, are unsustainable, it's hard for us to see the flooding in Asia half a planet away. We don't see that or see the drought and the deforestation in the Sahel in Africa, because it's half a planet away. Distance, as opposed to time, is our problem, that we just don't see it. Um, I think at least as difficult as those two things is what I call the mundane. Um, most people don't see a lot of things because they're ordinary. They're every day. They're so mundane and banal, you ignore them. Uh, water is a good example, both here and in this, in this building, in this curriculum, and in this country. Most people don't think about how much water they use unless their water bill is really hot. Um, <coughs> my neighbor has a nice green yard, and he has sprinklers, and his sprinklers run twice a day, even in the summer when it's pouring rain all day. The sprinklers are up and pumping out water. Um, researchers, the best estimate, let me ask you, how much water do we use in America in a year to water our yards? You know, everybody's got a nice green turf grass yard, and you know, you go out there with the, the fertilizer spreader, and you know, you put the fertilizer and you water your yard. How much water do you think? Is that cool? You like that? Okay, yeah. Um, do you know the sprinkler dance? There's a, there's a yeah. dance called the sprinkler. Yeah. I'm not. Show it to me. No, I'm not going to demonstrate it. <laughs> she has dignity. I don't. No, actually, you know, I'm glad I'm glad that this joke came up because that says something about the ubiquity of the sprinkler in American life, right? But people don't see it because it's ubiquitous. How much water do we use in America in a year? And most of this is water that's been filtered. It's potable water. You know, my neighborhood in South Tampa, we can use recycled water. Um, how much? Anybody want to take a guess? Now pick a number. Yeah, ten gallons a year for the country. Um, how about the best estimate is 19 trillion gallons of water every year, which is more than England uses, for example, for everything they do in, in the country. We spend, that, we spend that much water, and most of it's potable, drinkable water on our yards. Um, if you go to the mundane, if you go to the grocery store and you pick up a piece of fruit um, or buy flowers, you know, so if I want to buy flowers to the dinner table, you know, they're probably grown in Peru. They've been put on an airplane in a refrigerated unit and flown, you know, X thousand miles. The carbon footprint is amazing. Um, I can go to the grocery store and get fresh fruit, almost any kind of fruit, any time of year. 
because we'd flown it from Australia, I can buy apples from Australia at the Greenwise downtown. Um, and I don't think about the carbon footprint, uh, what in the business is called food miles. And, you know, most, most of your food is better traveled than you are. And we don't think about it. Well, maybe not the Chinese yeah. students, but that I am. Um, in, when I lived in Iowa, I was a member of an organic co-op, and almost everything had this kind of sign up to it. So if I went to buy eggs, there'd be a little thing that would say five miles, or 20 miles, or 200 miles. It would tell you how far those eggs had been transported from where they were collected, uh, laid and collected to there. And you could buy food that was genuinely local. It was an effort to get us to see the notion of food miles, and get us to think as mundane, everyday practice about my carbon footprint as I'm eating things. Are you going to say something? No? Sorry, you looked, I, I thought you were going to ask a question. Um, so, so the, the other is like to buy local? One of the answers, sure, one of the answers is to buy, I mean, you could be a locovore, somebody who eats the local food and buys local food. Uh, and there are all kinds of horror stories about uh, foods that have been shipped in from other parts of the country that use child and slave labor. But I'm you, and you know, so I would advocate being a local for and going to the farmers market. Or um, I, I grow a lot of my own flowers. I love gardening, landscape gardening, and I grow a lot of my own flowers. So that instead of buying the flowers at the grocery store that they've shipped in from, and it's not money. I, to be honest, I can afford four dollars a week for flowers, but I, I grow my own, cut them. I keep fresh flowers in the house because, you know, I, I, I go to the grocery store and I think. How much CO2 is in the atmosphere so I can have these fresh flowers flown in from Peru, you know, on my, on my dining table? Um, can I tell them my joke about my, my neighbor, Bob, and the flowers? Yes. Uh, my next door neighbor, Bob, who's a gay lawyer, lovely guy, um, he told me his family was coming over for dinner and his mother was going to be there and both his daughters were going to be there and blah, 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 and he was admiring my garden. so. Later that afternoon, I went and cut a bunch of flowers in my garden and arranged them in a nice little vase and brought them to Bob and said, here, here's for the table. And he looked at me and said, wouldn't you know it, the first time a man brings me flowers and he's straight. <laughs> what a waste. <laughs> what a waste. <laughs> OK. Um, dystopian science fiction is really if you guys aren't laughing at me, you're in trouble. <laughs> Dystopian science fiction is really good at this, at getting us to see things. It's what science fiction's about. So, you ever see the movie Blade Runner? It's an old classic science fiction movie. It's about... Harrison Ford. It's Her Harrison Ford. The young Harrison Ford. <laughs> you know, um, a company that makes cyborgs, yeah. androids, yeah. that um, are indistinguishable. Huh? Automatons. Automatons that are indistinguishable from human beings. What does the world like when, when you can't tell that, you know, not only does the professor sound like a bloody robot, he actually is? Or, okay. My, my, the other movie that I like, because I watched it with my daughter, is WALL-E. It's about the big box stores. It's about what I call trash Um It's about trying to make going to Walmart, WALL-E, Walmart, piles of trash, the consequences of that visible to us. Um, in the lecture online, I actually, there was a story in the New York Times science pages this week about uh, cardboard and shopping uh, online with, I don't know if I can say these things on, on film. There is a company that does a lot of online shopping that you've all heard of, where you could be a member of Company Prime, yeah. and you can order things for same day service or three hour later service, and the amount of energy, but just the cardboard, the piles of cardboard that get used when people have three, four deliveries a day um, of things from online shopping companies. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. We, my, we, wife, my wife we hates to, my wife just ordered five different pairs of shoes from Zapatos to try them on, and she's now shipping four of them back. Yeah. Um, and, you know, lots of boxes involved. Yeah. She only gave it one pair. Um, Another I don't quibble with her. She makes yeah. a lot more money yeah, than I do. She does what she wants. I don't feel that bad now. Huh? I don't feel that bad now. Aww. I don't need to make you feel bad. Oh, okay. Well, that's true. Okay. The other, um, I, 
I, I don't remember what other examples you're going to talk about, uh, or if you have other examples to mention. Well, yeah, but go ahead. Margaret Atwood? No. Because that's one of the um, main, I think, artists working in this area right now is Margaret Atwood. If you've read any of her books, she has a whole trilogy, the Mad Adam trilogy, oh, yeah. which is literally a sci-fi, um, post-climate change, disaster kind of story about what, what it actually happens to society. And there's a whole genre of books that has been just recently come, even since the last time we taught this class, there's a book called The Wind-Up Girl that is this, and it's set in, in a post-climate change Thailand where people can't travel anymore because there is no more carbon-based energy available. So how do you even, you live on an island, in an island nation, how does the world function at that point? So it's very good. And you know, I don't, I don't know if any of you are going to you know, start making feature-length movies. Yeah. But science fiction is a really good resource for how people who are incredibly visual and imaginative, science fiction films especially, yeah. have tried to get us to see. You know, the one of the one of the biggest genres is artificial intelligence. What happens is, you know, Google is making cars that can drive by themselves. Um, the American military. Uh, has now designed military units that are robots that make their own battlefield decisions and are completely autonomous, no humans involved. That's so scary. Instead of, instead of sending drones where everybody's sitting at McDill half a planet away, we are actually designing military weapon, weaponized <laughs> robot androids that have AI and think for themselves and will make their own kill choices. Skynet. Skynet, yeah, yes. It's, it's yeah, terrible. I mean, that's what, that's what those movies... Terminator movies were all about, yeah. trying to get us to see the future. Um, sustainability, I mean, you don't have to be doing that, but sustainability is about trying to make the future visible. And I, all I'm riffing is that science fiction films, dystopian science fiction films, are full of cool visual resources for you guys to think about. My favorite one. Mm -hmm. I see. Anybody know what that looks like? <laughs> yeah, not my turn. The, I couldn't get a picture of mine, but it's the readout, the dashboard readout for miles per gallon on the car. Um, I, I play, every time I teach and get out of here at 9 o'clock and make the drive home, I play a game with myself and I, I, I pick a route and I drive. I like to drive really fast. When I was younger, I was really kind of dangerous. Uh, <clears throat> When my wife got out of cancer treatment and they told her she had a 50% chance oh, of living yeah. for five years, we went out and bought a very fast convertible sports car and we lived out in the desert. And suffice it to say, we used to pretty regularly drop the top, turn up the stereo and drive on those flat, straight, middle of nowhere roads out in New Mexico where there's not even a driveway for 30 miles. And we would exceed the posted speed limit by sizable quantities, <laughs> shall we say. But I look at the miles per gallon readout, and I gain my car. I gain my route. I gain the lights. And I have a contest. You know, what's the highest miles per gallon I can make by the time I get home? And oddly enough, that makes me much more sensitive in my everyday ordinary driving, when I'm driving to work or driving to the grocery store, about miles per gallon. I know that sounds trivial, but it's making what is mundane and non-trivial very visible to me. And there have been a lot of studies, in fact, uh, group psychology, that putting miles per gallon readouts on people's dashboards can significantly affect the way a population drives their automobiles, their driving habits. By making this visible, you can change the way people drive. Um, okay, I think that's almost it. So I'm suggesting for you, as a, as a kind of general concept, that what we do in communicating about sustainability is we're trying to take something invisible and make it visible. We're trying to talk about causes and make distant in time, space, or ordinariness consequences meaningful, felt, real. And you know, this is a metaphor, of course. Um, I'm not suggesting that there's a solution to it. There's not a silver bullet. You know the metaphor of the silver bullet? You know, the, you got the silver bullet that kills Werewolves. Werewolves. Among right. other things, but... Yeah, it would kill me, too. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I just mean I watch a lot of the TV show Supernatural, but go ahead. <laughs> a werewolf riff tonight. So, yes, yes, you know, yes. There is no silver bullet. I'm going to suggest, as a different metaphor about making things visible, you think about a shotgun shell with lots of little silver pellets. Mm -hmm. There's not a solution. 
Nothing we're going to teach you is guaranteed to work, guaranteed to work all the time, guaranteed to work in every case. But there are lots of strategies. Yeah. Let's give them right. a second to finish talking here. I'll make a whole lot of noise if you'd like. Oh, no, you're good. Give it a second. Is it running or do I need to start? Okay. All right. All right, we're going to get started. If I don't start soon, I'm going to fall asleep, so we should get this part of the road. Okay. All right. So, I promised you that we would talk about um, the power of visuals, what infographics actually are, uh, before. If you have questions, as always, questions, comments, you know, insights, whatever, um, as usual, pop them in. Um, but feel free, especially if you have questions relating specifically to the assignment that kind of come up, crop up throughout this talk, um, please feel free to bring those up as well. I think um, this class has been, you all are great about asking questions about the projects and assignments, which is really useful because I think your classmates probably really appreciate it. All right, that being said, let's jump right into talking about the power of visuals. You may, uh, when you signed up for this class, communicating the value of sustainability, you may not have thought that we would talk about visuals, that we wouldn't be talking about pictures. I think for a lot of people, communication, means text or means speech. And the idea of communication and visuals or visual art uh, being connected is not something that we necessarily think of um, in the term communication. And certainly when you think, oh, I have English professors, well, English seems to mean language, not visuals. Um, but if you remember, we are not English professors, we are rhetoric professors. That's why we get to talk about visuals, because rhetoric uh, there's a whole field of rhetoric called visual rhetoric uh, premised on the idea that visuals are powerful ways to communicate. And in fact, uh, visuals, I would will argue, are possibly the most powerful forms of communication in our contemporary society. And that's because of two things. One, it's because of their ubiquity. And second, it's because of their immediacy and viscerality. So when I say ubiquity, Carl, I think this is yours from earlier. I'm afraid I'm going to step on it and Sorry. trip myself up. When I talk about uh, ubiquity, uh, to some extent, um, I'm talking about the internet specifically. That infographic that we asked you to look at for homework reading, why 13 reasons why your brain craves infographics. It's all an infographic about infographics. Uh, has the statistic in it that um, tells us Google Trends show that the use of visualized information has increased by literally hundreds of percent um, in some media and thousands of percent across the internet specifically. Uh, newspapers didn't used to have pictures. Newspapers didn't used to have graphs. If they did have pictures, often the only pictures would be political cartoons. We now expect images as a part of our media consumption, whether that's news, whether that's entertainment. Um, and in fact, much of our entertainment is purely visual. Uh, whether you think of television, which is a combination, multimedia combination of visual and oral, right? How are we actually taking in this information? If you read comic books, as I do, that is a very visual medium. There are words associated with it, but the relationship between the words and the images is different than in, say, a book with illustrations. But we have come to expect visuals to be all around us. And this creates what um, Nicholas Mirzoff, who's a communication scholar, calls visual culture. He's got this great book on visual culture. And in it, he starts off by explaining that human experience is now more visual and visualized than ever before, from the satellite picture to medical images of the interior of the human body. He's got this great idea that it's not just that our culture has changed because there are visuals all around us. It's that the fact that there are visuals all around us has actually changed the way that we process the world. The idea of the x-ray. Think about living in a time before you could x-ray the interior of a human body. Think about what it would mean to think about the inside of a human body without an x-ray. You're thinking about gross, squishy, fleshy, wet, viscerality. But when you suddenly have something like x-ray technology, you have a new way to think about the inside of the human body. You have a way to think about bones separate from messy flesh. 
and it's visuals that allow us to create these new ways of thinking. There's a famous picture of um, Earth from space, and it, the pale blue dot, do you, you know about this? It's the first ever image from space of the entire globe from, what year was that? 72? 60, early 70s? Early 70s? Or wait, no, it must, because it was before the moon landing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was early 60s. Early 60s, moon landing okay. Was 68. At any rate, it, the first ever image, photographic image of planet Earth from outside planet Earth. And many theorists credit that image with being a huge part of the success throughout the 60s of the environmental movement. Because that picture of the Earth, and you've seen it, even if you don't know you've seen it, you've seen it. That picture of the Earth gave us a way to imagine the Earth as a single contained unit, right? It's not the US versus Russia versus this versus that. It's we only got this one planet. This is one home, one world, one humanity. And that image, that visualization, gave us a way of thinking about that, right? And prompted that kind of thinking. So when we think about visual culture, it's ubiquity, not only in the sense that everywhere you go, you see manufactured images that are communicating with you. It is also ubiquitous in how deeply entrenched thinking visually has become in our approach to science, in our approach to environmentalism, in our approach to politics, you name it, whatever sphere of human culture, the rise of visuals has changed the way that we participate in that sphere. The other reason that visuals are important to think about communication is, I said, immediacy and viscerality. I didn't separate those out as bullets because they're closely, closely related. Visuals are immediate in the sense that we take them in very, very quickly. Again, that uh, 13 reasons your brain creates infographics includes the uh, fact that you can take in a holistic impression of a whole image in under one-tenth of a second. Tell me, if you'd like, how many words can you read in under one-tenth of a second? I actually have no idea. Like 25. Maybe one? I don't know. Like, you can read, I'm thinking about driving down the interstate, I can read the name of the town on the sign pretty quickly. So it's not to say that you can't read some number of words in under one tenth of a second, but if I give you an image that communicates the idea that um, uh, <coughs> abused puppies are sad and you should rescue them, I can do that in an image, right? I can show you a photograph of an abused dog at an animal shelter behind a cage, and you have some general sense of what I'm trying to communicate to you. And we're gonna look at it, actually this exact example uh, down the road here a little bit uh, for a different reason. But then I also give you a flyer with three paragraphs of text making the same argument. It's gonna take you a lot longer to take in the words than to take in the image. Uh, there's an argument by comics theorist Scott McCloud, who writes about, um, he has this wonderful book called Understanding Comics, and he writes about the fact that what comics do that is different from what books do that are just text, or images do that are just images, is they allow you to experience time differently. When you read a book, you start at the beginning, and or not even a book, any piece of text, right? You start at the beginning and you read to the end. As we've talked about at various points in this class, not everything gets read that way. Scientists read scientific articles jumping around. But when you decide you're going to read a piece of text, whether that's an entire book, whether that's just the conclusion of an article, whatever it is, your only choice is to read left to right, top to bottom, if you're reading in English, of course, other languages, it's a different order. But it is a linear experience that happens across time. That is reading. You don't get to say, you know what, I think I'll start in the middle and then read one word out on either side and just keep glancing back and forth. It doesn't work that way. Syntactically, language requires us to move in a particular order through the words. Images don't work like that. When you look at a painting, do you start in the top left corner and then scan across and then move down slightly and then scan across? That just seems silly, right? No, you take in a full impression. And of course, everyone experiences art a little differently. Um, how many of you have been to the Dali Museum in St. Pete? Quite a few. If you haven't been, please go. It's free to get in with your USF ID. So, um, which I didn't know the first time I went and I paid like $25. Anyway. The old one, the old uh, one or the new one? What, which one? What? The, the old, 
the old museum. one or the new one? Museum. There's a new one? Well, the, the one that is in that one, the new one, the it, one that we've been facing all that stuff. In St. Pete, yeah. My brother was part of the design team that designed architectural firm. Oh, made that, that place building. is beautiful. So, oh, my goodness. Yeah, so that's the one. You get it free with your USF ID. And um, there are several of his very, very large works, which in order to see, you have to actually stand at a distance from so you can perceive the whole. And then as you move closer, you can see how he's created these sort of illusions, these visual illusions in the paintings. And you can perceive the individual components that came together to give you a full impression from a distance. You can't do that with language. Images provide you a different way of experiencing. So if language is something that you experience in time, right? you have to sit and just listen to me talk for a certain amount of time for me to convey my ideas, images happen out of time. Images happen instantaneously. And then we get to control the time that we spend with the image. How close we get, how distant we get, how much time we spend on various parts of the image. And then what comics, this is Scott McCloud's point to return to where I started, what comic books do, or any sort of graphic novel like that, is they allow you to experience both forms of time together. So they give you a progression in which you are supposed to read, but within panels, within individual pieces of the art, you get to control your experience of time. It's a very interesting argument, and it's, I think, relevant to getting to the infographics here in a minute, in that when you create an infographic, you have to think about not only the individual elements, but what is the overall holistic impression that you are going to be giving a viewer? What are you doing with the image that captures them in that immediate moment when they first look at them? Speaking of capturing, oh, uh, uh, I don't know if it's Lazard or Lazard. I'm going to go with Lazard because I like that better. Okay, <laughs> Lazard and Atkinson tell us this um, in their fancy experimental piece. I forgot how detailed their methodology is, so if you're interested in an experimental uh, public, that's actually from a public relations, these are public relations professors. If you're interested in that kind of experimental setup, I bet that was a thrilling read for you. Uh, Lazard and, and Atkinson tell us that visual presentation influences the necessary first step in the communication process, gaining the viewer's attention and interest, right? This is the idea, the, again, related idea of viscerality. So what we're trying to do in any piece of communication is get people to pay attention. If you make a bunch of great, great, great uh, flyers that are very informative about microplastics, and you put them out in the world, but no one pays any attention because there's too much other stuff competing for attention, right? then you lose the power of immediacy and you never get to get to viscerality, right? The power to communicate some sort of visceral understanding beyond the ability of the text. Visceral means bodily, right? Visceral means we have some kind of gut reaction. And images allow us to have gut reactions in an instant in a way that text doesn't. I don't know how many of you are big readers of novels. How many of you have ever read a book and cried? Come on, be honest. No, really, just like four of us? Or are you just, you're just not admitting? Come on, oh my god. Uh, how many of you have watched a movie and cried? More, more. Um, how many of you have ever looked at a painting and had, or a, a photograph and just had an immediate reaction, whether it's not crying, whether it's crying or other emotional? Just immediate reaction. You're in sustainability and you have not looked at a photograph and had <laughs> What about the polar bears? You're terrible. Okay. Uh, <laughs> when you have an emotional reaction to text, it often takes time. You read a really good novel, right? And the build up to the end, or you watch a, a movie, and movies are, uh, like comic books, an interesting way to experience time. Uh, movies build to a point where you care enough about the characters to have an emotional reaction, or you care enough about this particular situation to have an emotional reaction. These kinds of still images that we're talking about uh, when we talk about infographics and similar photographs, paintings, etc., um, are able to give you a bodily reaction in a way that doesn't involve that expenditure of time and also involves our recognition of things that look like us, right, or things that look like our world. When you're reading a book and you have an emotional reaction, you have to first translate the words into some sort of mental understanding of what they mean. And we'll get to this in a minute. This is what um, 
O'Neill and Smith talk about the, the difference between visuals and text. This is what they refer to as visual, visuals are analogous, right? Visuals can directly represent things in the world, whereas texts are only symbolic. When it's text, you have to do the mental translation, uh, or when it's speech, for that matter. So viscerality is a, a key part of how images have an effect on us. And both the infographic that I had you read, the 13 reasons, and also this Lazard and Atkinson piece make a really good point about how, and, and we don't entirely know why, there's a lot of science trying to figure it out, social science and uh, psychology trying to figure it out. We are actually more likely to be persuaded by images than any other form of communication. Speech, text, visuals, visuals win every time. If you are ever convicted, uh, or not convicted, if you are ever charged with a crime, get a neuroscientist to come into the courtroom and show the jury images of brain scans of your brain and tell the jury that you're innocent and you will get off. People are persuaded by visuals of brain scans. People are persuaded by photographs of starving dogs. People are persuaded by, what? Do I want to know? I probably don't want to know. That was a class that we had a lot of pictures to watch those days. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're persuaded um, by pictures. Yes, we are, we are persuaded. And, and again, there's a lot of debate about why this is, and if this is like a thing, like a human trait, or if this is a result of, again, remember we live in a visual culture. We didn't always live in visual culture. Is it just our brains kind of adapting to the visuals that surround us all the time? No one's really sure. But people absolutely have demonstratively shown that we have visceral reactions to images in ways, something bad is going on tonight. Uh, we have visceral reactions to images in ways that we don't to text or speech. Uh, all right. Just to remind you, remember we talked about the rationalist paradox, right? Anyone, can anyone sum up for me what was the rationalist paradox? Yeah. Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> Come on, some brave soul. Tell me what the rationalist paradox is. I'm not going to give it to you. I'll just stand here in silence. I'm fine. Isn't that part of the deficit model? Yeah, yeah. Say more about that. Oh, that was like if you give people all the information, mm -hmm. they make their decisions. Right, but which is not how things work, no. right? Yeah, so the rationalist paradox. Like, we're supposed to be all rational creatures, <laughs> but paradoxically, we don't respond rationally into just being given information. And so this was all the readings about um, the cultural cognition, right? That we have our own worldviews and that shapes which information we find trustworthy and how we interpret that information and how we apply it. Uh, and so the idea that we can just give people lots of information and they'll go like, oh, okay, I'll totally upend my whole life and put solar panels on my house then. Like, that's not how it works. And part of what we will be talking about, again, I'm gonna show you pictures of sad puppies, just heads up. Um, is the immediacy and viscerality of images give us a way to communicate, so immediacy and viscerality, give us a way to communicate that does not re rely on rationalism, right? If your only tool in your communication toolbox is, I'm going to make a really well-worded argument that uses all the facts, the rationalist paradox tells us that's not going to work. It might work for some people at some time, <laughs> but it's not going to work for a lot of people. And this is what in that kind of appeal, that kind of, I'm just going to write a really good argument full of the facts, is what in rhetoric we refer to as logos. Uh, going back to the ancient Greeks, logos, root word, shared with logic, right, um, is an appeal based on reason, based on fact. Another one of the classic appeals, there's three, four if you like sophists, um, another one of the classic appeals is pathos. Pathos refers to Emotion, uh, same root word as pathetic, right? Pathos is an appeal, don't be dumb. Pathos is an appeal, it's going the wrong direction. There we go, okay. Pathos is an appeal to our emotions, to our bodily reactions to things, to viscerality. And the rationalist paradox, if the rationalist paradox tells us that um, factual arguments are not enough, Images give you a way of communicating that taps directly into this other kind of appeal because of their viscerality, because of their immediacy. So again, just to recap, we have to talk about visuals because they're everywhere. 
we would be doing you a disservice if we didn't talk about visuals in this course. Um, they're also a huge part specifically of sustainability, which we can talk about some more as well. Um, the reason, in addition to their ubiquity, the reason that visuals are something we need to talk about is that they're really, really useful for the work that you, many of you, I'm assuming, want to do. They're useful because they can break through the clutter of all of the inputs that are streaming around us all the time. If you just, all you put out into the world is text, 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 you're never gonna tap into an audience that doesn't already know they're interested in reading what you have to say, right? Maybe you have a really cool headline and you can catch their attention that way. They can read those words quickly enough to decide they want to keep reading. Um, I think maybe uh, clickbait headlines are the closest that text comes to having the same impact as visuals. But you can break through, wow, I just want to think about that. Okay, but you can break through people's indifference by capturing their attention with a visual that only takes them one tenth of a second to, to see. And you can design your visual in such a way that it creates such an emotional reaction in them that they want to keep looking and they want to read the words that are associated with your visual. Whether that's on the visual as an infographic, whether that's the text, the essay that goes with a picture, whatever it is. With me so far? Okay, let's keep going. All right, text versus visuals. I just wanted to uh, highlight these three differences that O'Neill and Smith in that article about climate change visuals talk about between text and visuals because I think this is a really, really useful breakdown, but they use fancy academic terminology, so I just wanted to gloss this quickly for you. Um, the first difference they say is that language, text, speech is symbolic, whereas visuals are analogical. Those are fancy words for um, text doesn't directly represent things in the world, and visuals do, or can. They don't always. They use the example of the sun, right? The word sun, S-U-N, doesn't look like the sun. It doesn't sound like the sun. I don't know that the sun sounds like anything, um, but you can draw a picture that looks like the sun, right? So that in our brains, do you remember when we talked about passive voice and Carl walked through how when you use a uh, passive voice sentence structure or when you use nominalizations, right, where you turn a verb into a noun to make your writing sound fancier, part of why that's harder to remember and get through is that your brain has to do more calculations on those sentences, right? When I say I threw the ball, your brain goes, you threw ball. But if I say the ball was thrown, you're like, your brain is like, ball. Oh, a thing happened to the ball. Okay, thrown. Right? It takes longer. Same thing with this difference between symbolic and analogical. When you're using language, your brain has to take an extra step to translate those words. When you're using direct representational images, your brain doesn't have to do that extra translational step. Make sense, right? This is part of the immediacy issue. The other, uh, the second difference um, between the two is this idea of propositional syntax versus loose connections. This is maybe their most academic -y term, and I love it because I'm a grammar nerd. What they're saying is in, in language, we have words that s explicitly signify the relationships between statements. Um, these are, again, words that we have talked about in the past when we talked about coherence and cohesion. There are these words that help you clue into how sentences fit together. However, they're for, because, in relation to, so it's not just words, it's phrases as well. Um, in relation to, moreover. So when you make a statement, I threw a ball, I could just make another statement, the window broke, right? But language gives us a word I can put there to tell you what the relationship between those statements is. So if I put the word therefore, I threw the ball, therefore the window broke, right? um, you know exactly what the relationship is between those facts. I am at fault for breaking the window. But if I show you a picture of me throwing a ball and then a picture of a broken window, there's no picture I can put in between that is in some way a contextless, right? It's, it's a picture that I could put in any set of images to mean because, or therefore, or I am at fault, right? The word therefore doesn't have any meaning of its own. The only reason the word therefore exists is to act as a link between facts 
we don't have any images that function like that. There are no images that function like connections between facts. And so you have to work harder to make explicit connections in images. So it's both a boon and a burden and a boon. Um, a burden in the sense that if you want to make a strong argument in a picture, you have to work harder to think about how you can do that. The benefit is pictures are open to interpretation. Art lovers for a century have loved the fact that images don't have propositional syntax. And many artistic cultures have developed actually around creating explicit propositional syntaxes. Like if you read, um, if you do any art history of old uh, medieval religious paintings, they have all kinds of symbolism built in that function as propositional syntax that tell you how to read the painting, right? Um, but, yeah, okay, that was not in the lecture, I'm just getting myself off track now. Okay, uh, the last thing about text versus visuals is the very, very closely related to the, the two before is that because visuals, or sorry, because text requires this sort of symbolic interpretation, and because it's clear that when I use words like therefore or however or moreover, I'm building an argument, right? Versus images which can be analogous, an image can look exactly like the thing it's supposed to represent. Um, I think photographs are the most obvious example. If you have a picture in your head that you're using to like make sense of the things I'm saying, put a photograph in your head right now. It doesn't matter what. Um, and the loose connections, it, it doesn't seem as explicit that images are trying to make arguments about the world, we have a tendency, and again, this is a well-researched fact, we have a tendency to treat text that says things we don't like as, well, that's an interpretation. That's their argument. That's their point of view. And we tend to treat photographs, even of things we don't like or don't want to agree with, as true. Right? But images are no less constructed and requiring interpretation, it's just that we tend to treat them as true in a way we don't treat text. Okay. Yeah, Chief. I still do not understand what is symbolic. The, um, so text is symbolic, right? And it's the idea that language is not, words don't function as pictures of things, they function as symbols of things. So the word sun, you have, is, are there weapons over there? Yes. Yeah. You have the arbitrary connection to the secret fire. Secret yeah. Fire. Yeah, I know. Oops. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to go there, though. Okay. I, I feel like that's. Is it? Is it? Do I want to go there? Sure. Okay. So Carl just gave me a good way to answer this question, which. Um, all right. Prepare, <laughs> brace yourselves for some 1950s structural linguistics. Okay. Uh, there is, I promise that's going to make sense in a second. In language, right, when I say like, oh, I'm going to tell you something in language, we have a thing that we call a word, right? So this pen is not great. Can you grab me another one? We have a thing. Will you turn the light on too, actually? I'm just asking for all the things. Sorry. Right, I'm not trying to treat you like the maid. I'm okay. happy to be the maid. We have, we have this thing. This is even worse, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, we have this thing in language that we call a word, right? The word sun. Now, sun is comprised, and this is the structural linguistics part, of two parts, right? There is the word kind of itself, the, the empty symbol, sun, S-U-N, which is what uh, Saussure, who is a, the structural linguistics guy from the 1950s, called the signifier, right? It's this sort of empty set of letters. And then, so we can think of it this way. It's just S plus U plus N. That's the, the sign we have decided, or the signifier we have decided to use in English. Um, in German, it would be sauna. What is it, what's sun in Spanish? Sol. Sol. Sol, right? Um, and then uh, you could list for all other languages. Right? What? What? Oh, do, yeah. I was like, I should ask you all. And then I was like, no, that's like 12 languages in the room. I can't put all of yours up there. Okay, so, so you can think of in all of the languages, we have some kind of signifier for that thing out there that produces heat during the day and makes for a weather in the summer the worst, right? We have a word for that, uh, a signifier. 
And then Saussure says there's a thing called the signified, and that's the actual thing out in the world that gets referred to. It's the mental thing in your head that you're imagining when I say sun. So when I say the signifier sun, you imagine, I am really good at drawing, you guys. I don't know if you knew that, right? You have some sort of image in your head. You have some sort of idea or concept in your head, not necessarily even an actual visual, but some concept, because not everything has a visual associated with it, right? Like if I say the word love, it's not like you're, I don't know, maybe you have a picture? I have a picture, of my partner. Um, the, uh, <laughs> but you have some sort of concept, something happens in your head, and you know what I mean. And what Saussure pointed out is that this is the sign, right? Words are, are signs. And his big insight was that the relationship between this and this is arbitrary. It is made up. There is no reason that we call this a sun, except that some accidents of history and culture led us to the point where we call this sun. <laughs> So that means in your brain, and this is, I'm coming, I'm answering your question. When we talk about language as symbols, in your brain, when I use a word, your brain has to translate this into this, right? But when I show you a photograph of a sign, if I, if I put a picture of the sun up there, you don't have to translate. You just, you're already at this. Does that make sense? You guys with me? So, yay, linguistics. I love linguistics. Okay. Uh, I really do. I used to teach a class on... Anyway, okay. So, uh, when text, and this is part of the explanation of the immediacy of visuals, when text, which is purely symbolic, is up against... I forgot what I came over here for. When text, which is purely symbolic... I don't hold it. Is up against... Uh, images which can be an analogy, they can look like the thing they're supposed to be, then we tend to treat this as closer to reality. Pictures are somehow more real or more true than words. Because words are just symbols. Now, of course, the funny thing here is, guess what, that's a symbol too. But um, in terms of how we think about what text and visuals are doing in our brains, we have a tendency because text is symbolic, because it uses propositional syntax, to think of it as interpretive <clears throat> versus images show the truth. Good? Yes? Okay. You're with me so far. Yay. Let's keep going. What time are we at? Um, uh, it, it, uh, what? 812. 8.12. Okay, perfect. We're great. Uh, so let's sort of shift gears. That was my theoretical introduction to what it is that we're doing and talking about, and let's shift gears and talk about infographics. Specifically, Lazard and Atkinson describe infographics as visual displays designed to communicate information that range from anything as simple as a pleasing arrangement of figures to stylized illustrations to complex interactive data animations. Infographics, loosely put, uh, are exactly what their name suggests they might be. They are information in graphical form, thus infographic. It is a way to take advantage, harness what visuals can do, they can capture people's attention really quickly, they can make people have emotional reactions in order to communicate data, in order to communicate information. Think about the difference, I tried to, ah, I, I forgot to put a, a picture in here that I wanted to put in. Um, think about the difference between a table of data versus a single graph, a bar graph that shows you that data, right? In order to make sense of a table of data, you have to read through all the numbers, all the numbers. What were the profit margins for May 1st and May 2nd and May 3rd and May 4th? A graph, a picture, gives you that information really quickly and succinctly, right? And so it's much easier often to get data and to understand data from images than from just text or numbers. Yeah? Yeah, okay. They look like this, for example. This is an example of an infographic that is purely about data conveyance. This is an infographic 
the title, I know it's very small for you, is um, Alternative Facts and Stats of the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And it literally is just a set of facts and stats. So we have down here, 4,700 gold, silver, and bronze medals will be presented at 805 victory ceremonies. And we have up here, athletes in the Olympic Village will consume 75,000 liters of milk over the course of the London 2012 Games. It would take one cow around 10 years to produce the same amount. And then we have some pictures of little milk bottles. So you can see in this infographic, we have a lot of disparate data being shared. And the images are being used exclusively as sort of little illustrations, mini illustrations. The images aren't doing a ton of work. But I'll tell you what, if you put all that information just in a bullet point list without the pictures, I would never look at this again. I would never read it. But the pictures um, maybe make grab your interest uh, a little bit more, make the whole thing more pleasing yeah. to look at. I know, the nudes are my favorite. 2,000 newts were relocated from the Olympic Park to the Waterworks Nature Reserve. They had to move the newts. Um, yeah, so there's something about the images that just makes it more fun to look at data that you otherwise might not even consider interesting. An infographic might also look like this, for example. Carland. Carland, this is a, a, for people who don't, do, do, Americans who grew up with board games, do you recognize this? Kind of it's like it's it's the built like Candyland, but the, also the game of life is really what it's drawing inspiration from. So uh, uh, the idea is this is merely this is um, this is clearly meant to evoke a board game with these individual slots and the start and finish. It is built as a timeline. So if you actually, again, I know it's very small, this is 1920, and then we move up, we have 1950 here, 1960, all the way through to the end at 2008. And the infographic itself is explaining how automobile history, driving history, has actually created, this is a sustainability infographic, has created a ton, a ton of problematic outcomes in terms of both sustainability and, uh, social, uh, like an economic, uh, I can't talk anymore, environmental and economic problems. There we go. And the visuals are not only used to perk up the timeline, make it interesting to look at, it also does some work in terms of giving us that feeling of what's going on. So you notice we start with these really lush trees, and by the time we make it all the way over here, we don't have any green and we have a bunch of oil there decorating the landscape. So there's an argument sort of implicitly being made in the background about this timeline and what it has done to our landscape. It's very subtle, but it's there. And the there's a pair of dice right here, which is part of, you know, like you would have dice on a board game. But dice also have a secondary meaning um, as symbols. Chance, right? Rolling the die. I'm going to roll the die. I'm going to take a chance on this. Um, and there is an implication, perhaps, that we are playing games with our economy, with our environment, when we allow cars to be such a driving factor of American history. So there's two kind of interesting implicit arguments going on in this, and, and I hope you see that, that the use of the visuals is, is very different from this infographic to this infographic. One is purely illustrative, one is visuals as part of the underlying argument of what this actual infographic is trying to communicate. It's not just the data, it's actually communicating an argument. It's communicating a point of view about cars. Another example of an infographic, um, I include this one because it's very uh, creative in this idea of using the slices of corn, oops, using the slices of corn as uh, almost like a chart where it's being broken down. It's a corn chart, like a pie chart. Uh, <laughs> no one likes pie chart? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have to admit, I have no idea what this is about. I believe this is Portuguese, yeah, tell me I'm yeah. right. Okay, what is it about? I've never had anyone look at this who speaks Portuguese. Can you just even from the, what is, 
Shoda is the meter. Uh, it's the the word for uh, uh, horn in Portuguese. Yeah. It's medio. Oh, okay. So uh, medio, it's a medium. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a play with uh, the word. Interesting. Okay. So, I'm guessing it's about just based on the numbers. It's no, 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 no. It's very far away. Um, I yeah, I don't know. So it's just about the uses of corn, maybe growth, etc. This is clearly about types. How long? How long it takes to grow? This is very exciting. I've had this infographic for a couple of years, and I had no idea what it was. <laughs> this is really exciting. Uh, this one, again, I wanted to show you, I, I can't say anything about what it's doing with the visual in terms of whether it's making an argument or just sharing facts, although it sounds like from your quick recap that it's more kind of sharing facts. My guess is, and I don't know anything about the author, if I had to pick, this is probably, is this a, an author stamp up here, poster? No. No, okay. Um, oh, you know what, There's, it's going to be right here, yeah. Um, if I had to guess, this looks like the kind of thing that a pro-agricultural lobby group would put out. Like, look at corn, it does all this cool stuff, it does all this great stuff. And again, if I wanted to give you all of this data about corn because I want you, the politician, to invest in my corn subsidy or vote for my corn subsidy bill, and I want your public to support you doing that, if I just put out a white paper that just had paragraph after paragraph of these facts, People aren't going to read it, probably. But this is a really, like, oh, what's that picture of corn? And, like, why does corn look like a pie chart? And that's kind of cool. Um, I mean, this part is, looks like a pie chart. Uh, so even if it's not making an argument, even if all it's doing is conveying data, it's doing so in a way that is way more engaging than your text. It's interesting to look at, right? Uh, come on. Come on. I believe. I believe in you. Why is it not? Yeah, if you, you did don't it a minute ago. I know, it just worked. <clears throat> I meant to bring the um, adapter to plug in your laptop. Is it doing the thing? It's doing the thing. Yeah, I can't do it with the arrows either. Anyone got any questions so far? <laughs> Anything? Do you, how many of you uh, knew what infographics were before? A few people? How many of you had seen it and you just didn't know you knew what they were? Like, probably everybody you've seen them online somewhere at some point. Um, there you go. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll do it by hand. Just tell me. The oh, infographic okay. thing, how what? we're going to create that using what? We'll get there. Oh, okay. Yes. You're very good at anticipating <laughs> like, the thing that I need to get to. It's not a bad, it's not a bad quality. Uh, this is a really interesting one that I really like. The title is Tracking Carbon Emissions. What is the visual metaphor that this is trying to play on? Carbon footprint, right? These these little individuals, can I actually, I'm going to grab the thing for the pointer. Oh, there it is. Uh, oh, you're fine. Um, these individual dots are countries, and the size of the dot is equates to its proportional carbon emission uh, rate, right? So um, unsurprising, United States, right down here. Um, we also have China. Um, we have, this is per capita carbon emissions by nation. So we're comparing the total carbon emission. So nations with more population are going to have a bigger emission uh, rate, probably. Um, per capita is averaging it out to by person, right? which means we suddenly get to see some interesting changes. So all of a sudden, Gibraltar has this really, really high per capita output. Um, but clearly, it's trying to play with the visual metaphor of the carbon footprint. So this is a, a third kind of approach. So, 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 so far, we've seen just using the images as illustrations to capture your attention with the immediacy, right? We have seen. Uh, the car land that makes this kind of more complex argument, trying to communicate a point of view about whether cars are good or bad. We've seen the corn, which I think, I have this like visceral reaction. I don't know why, but I, that, that picture brings me so much joy. It's just so bright and energizing, and the yellows, and the, I mean, look at that. Like, I want to eat that. It looks so good. And we've got this like cool blue going on. It's just, 
It brings me joy to look at that. And then we have a third approach, which is playing with, this is not purely an illustration, right? These are not just pictures of newts sitting next to text about newts. And it's not so much an argument necessarily being made by the visuals themselves, it is a visual metaphor, which is a slightly different thing. Yeah. Each of these is an infographic. They're all very different. The only thing that ties them together and makes them infographics, and I saw your hand there, Sam, ties them together and makes them infographics is that they are graphics that contain information. Some have more text, some have less text, some use visual metaphors, some use sort of comic-y looking illustrations. Um, one has this very cool organization like a board game. They're all infographics. You have a lot of freedom and choice as you think about what you're going to make. Sam, what do you got? Oh, I was just curious. I don't see the United States on the right foot. And I would be curious to see where it is. The, I found I it one. at one point, but I forget. Is it the red one? Oh, is it where? Oh, that's just that Virgin that Islands. <coughs> It's one of, I don't, oh, okay. so it's hard, hard for me it, it even to. It's the same color as yeah. the United States on that book. So it's probably in those three. That, there it is. There it is. Yes. Oh, Thank you. Really? Yeah. See, oh, color coding. Like green, yeah. The colors are probably the green ones as well. Yes, because we have Canada, Mexico, United States, yeah, China, 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 Japan, India. They're the continents, I believe. Yeah. And we're the heel. We're <laughs> such a heel. Yeah. I'm assuming it's continents because we have how many colors? One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. The, the divided by North America was seven. Yeah. Yeah. Asia. Yeah, yeah it's continents. continents. It's, it's divided by continents. So I guess. Oh, it, you know what it says that down here? Continents, North America, Europe. Oh, that is not. It's it's very very low quality, low res image. So even for me, it's hard to read the, the text. So good call on the colors. Uh, you are very thoughtful, Joshua. Thank you. All right. I raised that point earlier about images and text and how text has a harder time capturing our attention um, and breaking through the busyness and media saturation and general apathy, although maybe that's just me, that characterize much of our encounters with communications in the world. Uh, you see this addressed through images um, in examples like animal shelter, I don't know, uh, PR campaigns. So if I'm running an animal shelter and I want to convince you to send me a donation, I could send out a postcard to your house that says this, animal shelter, please donate. We are a no-kill shelter that saves hundreds of animals every year and we desperately need your help. We are completely grant and donation funded. Each animal costs about $3 per day. This cost includes spay and neuter services, boarding food, medical care, toys, bedding, and much more. Your charitable donation right now will allow us to care for the animals in our care and rescue those animals who still need our help donate today. Uh, on a, show me on a scale from, oh my god, I'm so invested and I love animals, to whatever, how are you feeling about this text? Where are you at? In between, we got some down, we got some medium. Come on, show me your thumbs. Show me. Down, down, down. All right, keep those thumbs up. I would like, keep them up, put them up, Leah. Sarah Tip, put them up. I would like your reaction, please. But I'm asking just about investment, not if you're depressed. Just, are, do you have an emotional reaction to this? Right? Yeah? Yeah? I kind of prefer to read the text. Oh, because it's sad. But that's the point. But you have a reaction, right? You have an emotional reaction. Anyone who likes the cats more, you can get out of my house, but whatever. No, I just, I love dogs. Okay, um, I want that dog in the bottom, and that, oh, this one's eyes, they're so cool, right? Pictures, pictures capture our reactions, pictures capture our emotions. So I challenge you, in thinking back to this infographics, for me, other than the corn, which I just think is like fun to look at and just feels happy and vibrant, I think mainly because of the colors more than the content, those infographics, I, I personally don't have really visceral emotional reactions to. I don't know if you looked at any of them and felt anything. So it's not that images necessarily always capitalize on our emotions in ways that text doesn't.
doesn't. But it does capture our attention, and it can, the images do capture our attention, and they can capture our emotions. So just bear that in mind as you're thinking about the infographic. If you want your audience to be involved emotionally with your work, think about what kinds of images, oh wow, I didn't realize that flips and that was, yeah. Uh, think about what kinds of images will create that emotional reaction in your intended audience. Um, another example of this is when we are displaying data, we have a lot of choices about how to display it. And we have the option to humanize very, very difficult data if we so choose. This is an example of a pretty simple data display. Uh, you know, I, it, we could even argue that this isn't even complicated or complex enough to count as an infographic. That is an argument and a hair. I will not split this evening. But this is a, an image that shows how many kids, um, and this is from 2014, um, how many kids have been killed by guns since, or it's, sorry, 2013, killed by guns since Newtown, where a mass shooting occurred. Pretty That's much. six months. It was not in the country. So yeah, six months. There was a, a mass shooting. Um, a lone shooter went into a school and killed 26 people. 26 people, most of whom were elementary school children in Newtown, Pennsylvania? Mass. Mass, Massachusetts. And Connecticut, you're right. Connecticut, okay, thank you. Connecticut. And the this graph shows from that shooting until May 7th the following year how many children ages 12 and under were killed in accidental shootings and how many were killed in alleged homicides. Now, you could very easily show this data in something that looked more like this. Bar graph, right? You have one bar for children who were killed by guns and accidents. You have one bar for children who were killed in alleged homicides during that six month period. What does it do to show it this way though? What does this buy you? People. People. Individuals. A bar chart, a bar chart combines all of these images, all of these individuals into a single whole. So this tells us that uh, since 1979, uh, 119,079 children and teens had been killed by guns um, versus a lower amount for Vietnam US military. And this is actually from Oh gosh, I found this in 2013, this chart, but I, I'm not sure when it was made. I'm sure this number is higher now for Iraq and Afghanistan, much higher. Um, so this is clearly trying to make an argument, this graph, it's some sort of point about how we have this you know, much larger number of deaths and um, that somehow it is relevant to compare those numbers to military deaths. I'm certainly not trying to uh, talk about gun control right now or impress on you whatever views I may have about gun control. The point is simply that this bar chart is clearly making an argument of some kind, but 119,079 is collapsed into this one unit, right? Versus this, which forces us to confront each of those victims as an individual. It may seem like a trivial difference, but I promise you it's not. When you humanize data, when you individualize data, when you use visuals to make data not all look the same, like if I didn't give you the title of this chart or the labels for the x-axis, this could be anything. This could be profits. This could be trees cut down per year. This could be, I don't know, carbon emissions. This could be anything. This could not be anything. This forces us to deal kind of directly with the data, the humanity of the data. Are you thinking something, Mary, or just no, hair? I'm, sorry. No, I do that when you have the long hair, you have to. Yeah. No, I actually have Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> I thought you were like no, I doing know. the I, hair I thing. Do, I do that a lot. But okay. Lot. But this time, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, you actually, funny, you said you didn't want to split hairs about this, but I was 
wondering why this is not maybe like on the borderline of being an infographic. Because to me, it seems like this is I, exactly what I thought of before I looked at any of the stuff for it. Yeah. Um, I think I would call this an infographic. Okay. It is a clever way to visualize data that includes both images, very stylized images, but images and text. You will find people who think that an infographic has to be uh, involve more than a single set of data. So you will, if you if you go and read like what is an infographic post on you know PR blogs or whatever, a lot of them will say it needs to include more than one data visualization. So they would say you could put this on an infographic, but then you would also have like a little pie chart that shows you something else, and you would have you know a fun background or whatever. I think this is an infographic. I'm I'm inclined to be more inclusive than less in all things in life. Yeah, Andy. So like just sort of clear, you can't just yeah. put, like put like something and then like the text on it. That would be enough. That actually, it's funny that you say that. I did uh, infographics in my visual rhetoric class last semester, and a student asked that exact question, <laughs> um, which is interesting. Now I want to know why. Like, why is that the go-to? Um, I. I am torn. Um, I am inclined to say that isn't enough, but only because an infographic, the one thing that everyone seems to agree on is that it has to include text of some kind. That it's a combination of images and text. If you don't want to make it so busy that you want to send one clear message, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's, that's the reason why. But you where's the, where's the, remember, uh, infographics are graphics that, um, communicate informa information to a lot of different ends, to entertain, to persuade, to whatever. Where is the information, the data, in that idea? Like, if it's just a picture of like, okay, let's say that my argument is squirrels are the effing worst, and so I put a picture of a squirrel, <laughs> and then the slash with a circle over it, where's the data? That would be my question to you. Does that make sense? So you do need to have data as part of your information. Okay, well, what about if you put some knots and you just put in the uh, bead, what they did inside each knot, and then they're horrible because of those knots with the information in it? Okay, yeah. I actually really like squirrels, don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we at time wise, y'all? We're getting to it. It's okay. uh, 8 36. All right, good. We're almost done. Almost, almost done. And keep, keep asking those questions about, like, is this infographic -y enough or an infographic? Because I promise. Multiple of you will be confronting that question as you are working on your own ideas for your own infographics. Um, this is an example, again, of something where the images are used more as illustrations than anything else. This is a logistics of sustainability. I show you this example because I want to draw your attention to some of the choices that you will have to make, and we'll talk about this more with your design reading next week, that are not just about the content of the images. So if you didn't have a title for this, would you be able to guess that it was like maybe probably environmental? Why? Green. Green. What does what does green mean to you? So green can mean the environment. What else? So what? So you got a whole plot description on that. Oh well, yeah, certainly. Give me some of the the basic cultural and and I promise you there are people in this room who have different cultural frames and references for whom green means different things. Uh, what does green mean to you? Money, Money. environment, what else? Chloroform. What? Chloroform. Chloroform. Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. Okay, I was like, chloroform, you have an interesting cultural flavor. <laughs> 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 All right, chlorophyll. What else? Really? Nobody's going to say envy? Land. Land. Envy. Um, I think it's villains. Money. What? Villains. Villains, yes, right? The Riddler. Yeah, that guy's definitely building us. Uh, money. What does red mean to you? What? I can't hear you at all. Say it on. You are in danger. Oh, danger. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, danger. What else does red mean? Energy. Hot. Hot. Did you know that in global warming, I'm so sorry, Sarah, I cut you off. In the global warming maps, red is actually cooler areas and blue is the hotter areas because scientists don't pay attention to cultural frameworks. I don't know. Uh, I met a bunch of visualiz uh, visualization climate change scientists uh, last summer at, uh, in Colorado, and they were like, wait, why would people think that blue means cold? And I was like, who are you? 
Okay. Sarah, what were you going to say about red? Blood, yes, absolutely. Which is sort of like with the danger piece as well. We have associations with visuals that extend beyond the content, right? So when you see these shades of green and blue, that says something different to you than a, um, an infographic, for example, that was primarily black and red. So color is something that we'll talk about next week even more. Um, also, remember that your, in addition to colors being culturally determined, symbolism is also culturally determined. So this little guy right here, what is this picture? A piggy bank. Are there places in the world where piggy banks are not a thing? Probably. I'm not actually sure, but I'm guessing so. Yeah, I mean, certainly there are places where piggy banks in the United States, at least, uh, in my experience, are associated with giving children allowance, right? And then children can put their change and their allowance in their piggy bank, and then at some point you break your piggy bank open um, and you buy your... Uh, uh, a dog, yes. Okay, good, yes. And then you buy your puppy. Um, that is not a cultural symbol, image, reference point that is going to resonate with people who live at a level of poverty where the idea of giving your children spare change for allowance is ridiculous, right? So you have to be aware of the cultural content of your symbols as well as your colors, etc. All right. This is a very cool visualization that um, the link is on uh, the, the Canvas modules page because this is on um, listed on the reading requirements for next week. It is a chart called Colors and Culture, and I would like to, I wanted to show you a preview of it. The way you read it is each of these, um, each of these radial spokes is a different uh, concept, so mystery, death, danger, blood, love, war, um, is each of these radial spokes, and then each full circle around is a culture. And so you can look and see, oh wow, there are a lot of cultures that associate, uh, 41 is, I don't remember, heat, yeah. So there's a lot of cultures that associate red with heat, right, but then whatever, uh, is going on right here, like there's a lot of difference across culture. So this is a very cool little reference chart you can use. Um, I also show you that because I was going to show you this. Those Both of these visualizations are by the same guy, a guy named David McCamless, who if you have any interest in design and data design, please, for the love of everything, watch his TED Talks and go to his website. It's Information is Beautiful. And he designs these very, very interesting data visualizations that you let you get a very quick grasp on very complicated data. Mary, what you got? What? Uh, David McCandless. Um, it's on the syllabus as well because you have that yeah, one yeah. Uh, yeah. assigned for next week. But if you want to look it up in advance. Um, this is a data visualization that, again, some people would want to say, well, this isn't really an infographic. It's not that graphic-y. I think it is, um, because what it does is it takes very, very, very uh, complex data about uh, where billions of dollars go and puts it in a graphical form that makes it very easy to apprehend and compare. So for example, we have the $5,700, uh, this is not $5,700, right, but it's $5,700 billion, um, are going to the global healthcare budget. Of that, this is the global healthcare budget, the entire healthcare budget of the globe, almost a quarter of it is US healthcare. And when I say 1200 billion versus 5700 billion, that's, I mean, I guess it's more like a fifth, sorry guys. Okay, it's a fifth, not a quarter. Um, when I say those numbers to you, those numbers are so big, and McCandless talks about this exact image in his TED talk, if you, if you go look that up. Those numbers are so big that they're incomprehensible. Like how how many uh, how many burgers can I buy with twelve hundred billion dollars? Like I have no idea. That number doesn't mean anything to me. I think the biggest number of dollars that means anything to me is a million. For some reason, that's like my cutoff. Anything over one million, I'm like, maybe I could buy a jet. I don't know how much do jets cost, <laughs> right? So I definitely have no idea what to do with fifty seven hundred billion. 
And it doesn't mean anything to me when you tell me that US healthcare is like almost a fifth of that. But when you show it to me in this visual form, it makes it so suddenly apparent that we are one country eating up an inordinate share of the global pie. And that tells us something about the state of US healthcare and the overspending in US healthcare. So I, I mean, I think that this is perfectly functional as an infographic because it is using the conventions of graphical design to share information in a way that is compelling and that makes a point. So there's also this kind of more simplistic approach. And then the last thing I wanted to say before I leave you, so these are some images from some comic books I like. The last thing I wanted to say is that a lot of the infographics, including a lot of the ones that I showed you tonight, that last one from the Canlis, the first one with the facts from the Olympics, a lot of them don't seem to have a point of view. Like if you go out and just go Google infographic and look at some of them, they don't have a point of view. They're literally just collections of facts. And what I would like to see from your infographics for this project is a point of view. Because what we're asking you to do is to take some topic in sustainability that you care about. Anything, total your choice. First accommodation project we told you what to write about, you have total freedom now. And we want you to make an infographic that persuades one individual to change their behavior and live more sustainably in some way. So in order to do that, you need to pick a group of individuals that your infographic appeals to, right? Remember, there's no silver bullets, there's only silver buckshot. And that needs to be a really specific group. So maybe your group is undergraduates at USF, right? Maybe that's your audience. Maybe your audience is people who fly coach on Delta. Pick a really specific audience and then think about what are the appeals, what are the pathos, the emotional appeals that I can use, what are the colors I can use to grab their attention, tell them a story, make them care so they change their behavior. And the reason I show you this picture and, and close out with this is that comic books have been doing this forever very, very well. Comic books combine information and graphics in a way that makes us care and can even make us change our behaviors for so long and so well that the US Army actually has a history of using comics all the way back, and Chris is nodding, all the way back to the 1930s. They use comics to train soldiers. Yeah. Every, like every maintenance manual Everything. has a comic book. Yes. Your weapon, comic book. Yes, because they're so good at persuading people to care and getting them to change their behavior. People are picking up keys, so I guess I'm out of time. Yeah. Oh, what time is it? Did I go over? It's 8.46. Oh, okay. You're right on the button. Yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm right on the button. Um, if you have more questions about the infographic project, we can hang around for a couple of minutes. Please remember your proposal is due next week, but it's very informal. You just answer those questions. Good? What do you use to make them? Oh, yes, you asked that question. That's what we're going to spend all next week in class doing, is practicing with the technology. Thank you. I She's going to show you know. two different softwares and how to use them. Yes, yeah. and we'll Very spend easy. the entire class workshopping with those, and I'll, I'll work you through them. So please, hey, everybody, one last thing. Real quick, real quick. I'm sorry, I should have said this uh, before. We were going to send an email as well. Please bring a computer to class next week if you have one. iPad or tablet should work too, but a laptop is best because we're going to play with technologies to make infographics, and I'm going to show you some really easy ones that you can use for free on the internet. So, thank you. All right. Yeah. Oh.